Good morning, everybody. It's 10 o'clock and I'm going to uh, call the meeting of the Board of State and Community Corrections to order. And I'd like to welcome all of you who are joining us in the room and virtually. I wanna thank all the board members who made huge efforts to get here in person. Um, I'm pleasantly surprised to see Judge Gard with us today. She wasn't gonna be able to make it, but she felt so strongly she made it anyway. So super happy about that. On Zoom, I'm hoping Anhalis is available. Um, she will join at a later time, but she okay. is on her, her okay. way. And um, Dr. Le is, um, we're searching for her right now. We're searching for her? <laughs> All right. Well, we'll give a, take a little breath and search for her. Well, um, we're waiting for that. Adam, would you like to take this opportunity and do that ever-present instructions to everybody on Zoom and in this room regarding uh, how to get uh, an opportunity to publicly comment on any items before the board? Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. We are meeting both in person and virtually, and we will support public participation during this meeting through the Zoom webinar platform. Board members, for those participating remotely, um, if you wish to make a comment, please use the raised hand feature on Zoom or physically raise your hand so we could see you. Members in the room, please remember to state your name before making a comment so that those participating remotely may know who is speaking. Regarding voting, all agenda items that require a vote will require a roll call vote at the end of each agenda item. Board members in the room, please remember to turn off your microphones when you are not speaking. And please remember to speak into your microphone so that all, may, all on Zoom may hear you. Members of the public, we will give the members of the public the opportunity to comment after the presentation of each agenda item and prior to the board voting on an item. You will have two minutes for your comment. After your two minutes have ended, I will verbally let you know, and you may watch the screen where we will display a two minute timer and those in queue. We encourage anyone wishing to make a public comment to raise their hand at the start of each agenda item being discussed. Um, members of the public will not have the ability to unmute yourself during the discussion until the chair opens it up for public comment. You must raise your hand on Zoom or send a request through public comment at bscc.ca.gov. This is also available on our website. If you've sent in a request through the public comment email box, I will call you on your email address or identifier you provided in your email. If you are calling by phone, dial star nine to raise your hand, dial star six to unmute yourself. I will call on those who have raised their hands and those who have emailed your request to speak and I will ask you to unmute yourself. As a reminder, I will notify you when the two minute timer um, sounds and will be visible on the screen. So please try to keep track of your time. When the time is up, you must complete your comments so that we have the opportunity to hear from everyone who wants to make a comment. Also, if your comment aligns with other speakers, please feel free to associate your comment with prior speakers. Thank you for your patience and understanding as we work to ensure all speakers can be heard. Agenda item five is the opportunity for any member of the public to make a comment on any agenda items or other comments in general. We will call the members on Zoom first, then members here in the room, public participants in the room. When it is time for public comment, please form a line at the podium. If you wish to, if you wish to, please state your name. As always, thank you for your patience. Madam Chair, that concludes my instructions. Thank you, Adam. Uh, this is an unusual day at the BSCC. Uh, the turnover uh, on the board, as well as some enormous staff changes are on our agenda and we're gonna take care of that portion that is somewhat ceremonial prior to getting to the meat of the agenda. Um, I have been here 11 years and prior to that served at CSA and I have never seen uh, the number of new members uh, appointed to the board uh, between meetings in my tenure here. And so um, I'm going to give an opportunity to each of our new members to speak in a moment, but you know me, I like to speak first and often. Uh, with that said, I see Dr. Lai joining us out of Hawaii, apparently. It's a really good background you got there. It's good to see you and thank you for joining us today. Uh, we have a new member, Dr. Lai, a new probation chief, Jennifer Banning, 
Sheriff Christina Corpus from San Mateo, I'm sorry, from Alameda County. San Mateo, why does it say, I said, Adam, this is the first time you've made an error. It says Alameda, just for the record. Uh, I knew it was San Mateo because I was there. And uh, Police Chief Bill Scott from San Francisco, and I'm super proud I got that correct. Um, Sheriff Lai, I'm sorry, Sheriff Lai, Dr. Lai represents a new position to the board. Um, remember, uh, during the last legislative session, we were uh, given two new spots on the board, and uh, Dr. Lai will... Um, represent a medical physician on our board. And we're very, very happy that that one slot has been filled. And as I say that, um, I would like to give um, uh, my gratitude to the appointments office. They have been extremely busy uh, between meetings and um, we're delighted uh, that they've been able to fill all these positions. The board does meaningful work and we need as many people here as possible. Um, with that said, I'd like everybody uh, to take an opportunity to uh, welcome everybody in the room and give us a few remarks about yourself. And I'll start with Dr. Lai. Hi, everybody. My name is Karen Lai. Thank you for having me today. I'm um, so delighted to be part of this board moving forward. Um, so I uh, am... I'm a medical doctor, I'm a psychiatrist, um, that is my specialty, and I treat children, adolescents, and young adults in the um, behavioral health clinics in Contra Costa County. Um, I also have a special interest in systems of care and um, being involved in communities and improving um, health in communities. Uh, I have treated, um, adolescents in the juvenile um, hall system and and I am you know very interested in seeing how I can provide support to improving care in that system. Thank you doctor. Next I'd ask Chief Banning from Lassen County. Hello I'm Chief Jennifer Branning with the Lassen County Probation Department. I've been the chief for approximately um, 10 years, 13 years maybe. Um, I have, um, I'm excited to be on the board um, and to bring some of my perspective from a very rural county and how we implement new policy and programs. Thank you. Thank you. Sheriff Corpus. Good morning, everyone, members of the public. Uh, my name is Christina Corpus and I am the sheriff of San Mateo County. Uh, I became sheriff in January of 2023. Uh, I have uh, worked for the County of San Mateo for 30 years. Uh, 25 of those with the sheriff's office. And I have a unique perspective that I started my career as a correctional officer. And so I've worked in our jails and um, in our correctional facilities and know um, how important it is uh, to make changes and especially to support um, our incarcerated population that has uh, many challenges, uh, especially with supporting with mental health. I'm very honored to be a part of this prestigious board and I look forward to the work. Thank you. Thank you. And Chief Scott. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is William Scott or Bill Scott. I am the Chief of Police of the San Francisco Police Department. I've uh, been in the law enforcement profession for uh, 35 years next week. The first 27 and change was with the LAPD, Los Angeles Police Department. Um, I left there as a deputy chief to take the job as the chief of police in San Francisco, where I've been um, the chief in the SFPD for almost eight years now. So I am thrilled to be here. Um, it's an honor to be here and hope I can hope I can bring some value with my 35 years of experience and life experiences to this board. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, also good news today, wherever he may be, is uh, the reappointment of uh, Chief Probation Officer Kirk Haynes to the board. He has um, graciously uh, decided to stay with us and continue the hard work we ask of him every day. Now, new board members, please don't take anything personally with the laughs of the old board members regarding staying. Uh, with that said, I'd like to invite all of you uh, to join me in the well. And uh, we're going to grab a microphone, I think. We're going to administer the oath. And Dr. Lai, this will seem odd to you, but if you would not mind standing for the oath, if your camera can handle it. Thank you. Would, would you like me to show myself standing? 
No, I trust you. We trust you. Okay. <laughs> I'm standing. Well, we don't need to standing. Thank you. Thank you. You can tell Dr. Lai is going to be a good board member. She wants to know exactly what I want. Yeah, Kirk. Come on, Kirk. Don't yeah. be scared. <laughs> Well, this isn't a good shot. Okay. Is this better over here? Better over here? Uh, yeah, that's better. Uh, we get a lot of Thank you. I'm not proud of the angle you're going to get this picture from, but okay. um, I'm going to ask you uh, to, to do the oath, and I will ask you to state your name, and you may all do it at once since we already know who all of you are. So we'll begin. I. I. I'm going to ask I, to hold the mic in his non-raised hand kind of in the middle to pick up the voices there okay perfect thank you <laughs> but we're not bossy uh begin again i i, I, I Scott. do solemnly swear do solemnly, do solemnly swear. swear that i will support and defend that, that, I, will that I will support and defend and the constitution of the united states the constitution, the constitution of the united states, states and the constitution of the state of california and the, and the Constitution, Constitution of the State of California. And against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And against, and against all, all enemies, enemies, foreign and, and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That, that I, I will bear, bear true faith, faith and allegiance. To the Constitution of the United States. To the, to the Constitution of the United States. States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the, and Constitution, the Constitution of the State of California. I take this obligation freely. I take, I take this, this obligation, obligation freely, without any mental reservation, without, without any, any mental reservation, reservation, or purpose of evasion, or purpose, or purpose of, of, evasion. of evasion, and that I will well and faithfully, and that, and I, that will I will well, well and faithfully, faithfully discharge the duties, discharge, discharge the, the duties, duties, upon which I am about to enter, upon, upon which, which I am about to enter. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. I know that I, I know that was cumbersome, but uh, it's the way we're doing it. We're gonna we're gonna do photo ops. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Doctor Lai. Thank you. Oh, they're taking. Adam, will you please take the roll? Chair Penner. Present. Mr. McCumber is absent today. Mr. Johnson. Good morning. Present. Mr. Haynes. Present. Mr. Taylor. Present. Ms. Corpus. Present. Ms. Batting. Branning. Present. Ms. Gard. Here. Mr. Scott. Present. <laughs> Oops. Oh, Mr. Two Scots in the house. <laughs> Mr. Budnick. Here. <laughs> Ms. Zaragoza will join at 1030. And Ms. Kumpion. Here. And Ms. Lai. Here. Madam Chair, we have a quorum. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. I already. Oh. Going to keep me in line on our last last meeting. Um, boy, another exciting turn of events at the BSCC. Um, I'm really pleased to announce uh, our um, next 
employee, soon to be our director of in-custody death review for the BSCC, Allison Ganter. Would you please stand, Allison? Allison was recently appointed and we could not be more delighted. Um, she's been with our FSO division for 10 years and she has been instrumental in building so many processes at the BSCC. Uh, I could not even begin to recount them all for you. Uh, she does a great deal of heavy lifting for this organization and uh, aside from appearing at these board meetings and giving us uh, incredible report outs and valuable information. She is dearly beloved by her staff. She is an excellent leader uh, and um, has earned every bit of this new job. She may not think that in a month or two, but right now um, she's still smiling. I do see Allison's husband in the audience and I'd like to thank and acknowledge him for all the time uh, Allison spends here at the office. It's really good to have you here. Allison, would you like to? Introduce your husband. Thank you so much, Linda. This is my husband, Jeremy Ganter, and thank you so much for being here and supporting. Thank you, thank Jeremy. You. Good to have you, um, Allison. Let's 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 okay. do the honors for you. Do I need a mic? Yes, this is very exciting. Hero, right? It is. <laughs> she is a national hero, and she's so important, she gets to say her name all by herself, unlike <laughs> you other people that just received the oath. I. I. Your name now. Allison Ganter. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And that I will bear true faith and allegiance. And that I will bear truth, faith, and allegiance. To the Constitution of the United States. To the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California and the Constitution of the State of California. I take this obligation freely. I take this obligation freely. Without mental, reserva mental reservation. Without mental reservation. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. And that I will faithfully, well and faithfully. And that I will well and faithfully. Sorry, discharge the duties. Discharge the duties. Upon which I am about to enter. Upon which I am about to enter. Thank you, Alice. Thank you. It's a lot harder to listen to it's hard to look Allison in the face and seriously give her an oath. Allison, I'd like to... Yes, thank you so much, Chair Penner. Um, and good morning, board members, community members, and colleagues. Um, and again, thank you to my husband, Jeremy, for being here. Um, I also want to thank my incredible FSO team. Um, without their continued support, I wouldn't be able to be here. Um, so thank you so much um, to my team. I'm humbled and honored to be appointed to this position and appreciate Governor Newsom's and this board's uh, confidence in my ability. This is gonna be a really difficult job um, with emotional impact and I'm ready to get to work. Um, I'm invested in this work and the work is going to include a lot of listening, asking for help and prioritizing an awful lot of tasks. And about that work, um, as the director of in-custody death review, I'm going to be able to navigate um, the, the chasm, really, between grieving families and law enforcement agencies to access and provide meaningful information to make recommendations for local detention facilities to re reduce and prevent uh, deaths. And this is a really uh, challenging topic. It's hard to talk about death, um, but we need to understand why these events are happening um, to inform policy practices, uh, best practices, regulations, um, and information sharing, all of which is gonna have a, a really um, invaluable system, uh, system impact change across our state. So I intend to engage with our board, with detention facility administrators, um, and with family members and with the community 
we've heard from families already and we've been in contact with some of them. Um, I'm going to prioritize transparency, communication, listening, and fact-based information gathering and sharing. The first actions, um, my first actions will include standing up the division. We need a team to start analyzing the data and drafting policy for how we will conduct our reviews. We need to analyze the data we have so far. Um, unfortunately, there's been 31 deaths reported to us since July 1st of this year when the office became effective. Um, I'll meet with families and community members to listen to them, to hear input, to hear questions and concerns. We wanna be able to outline uh, the expectations of this division and understand what people are looking for and figure out how to, to, to put together people's expectations and, and policy recommendations that we have. Meet with Sheriff's Office uh, and probation personnel, understand what data are out there and how we access those data and consult with other subject matter experts. Um, for instance, we'll have the opportunity or I'll have the opportunity to share data and consult with Dr. Lai and other board members um, who have expertise in medical and behavioral health care. So ultimately, um, the division is going to de develop policy and procedures based on the information that we can access. When we have access to that information, we'll share reports and information with the public. We'll develop reports and recommendations, not only for um, specific um, detention facilities, but also for, for statewide um, policy uh, recommendations, make regulation, re uh, make regulation revisions, and be available for families and detention facilities, both as a resource. Um, this is critical work, as we all know. Um, and while there's urgency, um, it's also really important to get this done correctly, and that's going to take some time. Um, as I begin this work, as I said, um, I'm going to be listening. I'm going to be asking for a lot of help from many different subject matter experts um, and from the team we bring on here. Um, it's challenging. It's emotional. Um, it's really important, and it's most important to get this right. Um, what we're gonna understand in the coming months is going to be very different from what we know right now about in custody deaths. Um, again, I'm really, really humbled. Um, I'm looking forward to this work. Um, I'm open to questions and feedback. I mean, in the meantime, if, if people have questions or, or comments or concerns, as we get the division set up, they can email us at icdrpublic at bscc.ca.gov. Um, and, and again, thank you all so much for your support and um, I'm ready to get to work on this really challenging um, but important topic. Thank you. Well, Allison, um, it was such a high priority and uh, for you to be the first sitting in this position uh, with your expertise and your deep care and concern for the public and anything that they might suffer as a result of being in custody is enormous. So I'm, I'm delighted. I know many on the board uh, know about you and your expertise. I'd like to give them an opportunity to say anything if they'd like. First, um, Chief Haynes from Fresno County. I want to say congratulations. Uh, I am so happy for you, Allison, and for um, what I know is going to be just an awesome job of you setting up this uh, this new division. Um, and like uh, Chair Pinner was saying, um, you have all of the the knowledge and the passion, the compassion to to be able to do this work in a technical way, but also in a compassionate way. So I just want to say thank you so much for your work, and I'm hoping that we could still do something with Title Two Fifteen regs. <laughs> but uh, but but uh, but I know you've been just awesome, and um, and I just want to say thank you for your commitment. Thank you, Chief Haynes. Yeah, I want to second also what Chief Haynes said about uh, the word compassion. It's just been watching you do this job for the last few years, um, and how you kind of balance compassion and diligence and professionalism um, has just been incredible to watch. So um, I'm really happy for you. I'm really excited for you, and thank you for stepping up to the plate. Thank you, Scott. I would just like to thank you for all of your work. You have dedicated um, a lot of your passion to um, institutions. Your knowledge is going to carry you through this um, new standing up of this program. And I definitely um, know that your passion and your compassion for um, everything and your attention to detail will do well with this. So congratulations. Thank you, Chief Branning. And I'll, I'll just say real quick, congratulations. Um, it's been a pleasure working with you up to this point. I know 
Now, um, I, all these new people here, I I feel like a veteran now. <laughs> That's how we do. It's awesome. I, I like it. Um, but I will say, as a, as a person that runs a correctional facility, the expectation when someone comes into our custody is that they leave it better than they came in. And when that doesn't happen, I think the public needs to be reassured that it's being looked at from all angles and really from an independent lens. So I, I think you do have a heavy lift. I think you have a lot of partners that are going to support you in that. And congratulations again. Thanks, Sheriff Taylor. All right. And I'll say on the record, I did speak to Allison earlier and, and congratulated her. I mean, she, just in-depth knowledge. Your report outs have been exceptional. Um, and it allowed me to make, you know, real good sound decisions with matters that came up. So I really appreciate uh, everything that you have done for BSEC. I expect you to do even more. Uh, and, and you really care about your position. So I appreciate all that you have done during my 13 months here. So I got Sheriff Taylor beat by a little bit. <laughs> but uh, it's been great working with you, and I'm just happy you're still here. So congratulations. I wish you the best in, in your new assignment. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, congratulations, Allison. I know we spoke earlier, too, but thank you for bringing compassion to this space and all the work that you've done um, with the inspections. So super happy that your expertise is being used in this capacity now. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is, this is uh, uh, you may sit down now, Allison. You sat down before it was time, but okay. Um, I see Annalise has joined us. How are you? Good to have you. Uh, Hi everyone. Good morning. Yes, and uh, I I would take the liberty right now to uh, indicate to the board that you have changed jobs since we last saw you. Do you want to expand a little bit before we move forward? Sure. Yeah. After eleven years with the alternate public defender's office, um, half of that time I spent representing young people in the system and was working on a, a passion project. You know, for the last you know, six months or so with an organization called LA Room and Board, who has traditionally served um, 18 to 24 year olds experiencing homelessness um, during college. So it's about supporting young people in higher education. And we've established a partnership with the courts here and are now serving justice involved youth um, SYTF youth who are pursuing higher education um, in a residential um, placement. Um, and so I'm, I'm now their deputy director of youth justice programs and looking to hopefully create other pathways for justice involved populations um, to have, you know, secure housing while they pursue higher ed. So it's been very exciting um, in this transition. Thank you. Thank you. Sounds like it's going to be a great endeavor and hopefully on one of my trips to LA, we can uh, tour and see what uh, it's all about from the ground level. That's really great. And congratulations to you on the new job. Um, and now uh, to something that's difficult for all of us. Uh, and that is to have our last executive director's report from Kathleen T. Howard. And um, uh, it's bittersweet. I mean, we're very excited for you, and I won't be able to make fun of your executive director's report anymore once you can't give it again, but uh, let's kick it off right now, Katie, and uh, tell us what's going on at the BSCC. Thank you so much, Madam Chair and members of the board. Uh, yes, many, many, many feelings um, all around today. Um, I want to start uh, with congratulations and welcome to all of the new board members and reappointed members. Dr. Lai, so glad you're here as well. Um, there were a few really important things that I felt I wanted to help wrap up before I made my retirement announcement. And really high on that list was the appointment of the director of in-custody death review. And I wanna say um, congratulations and thank you um, to my very good friend and colleague, Allison Ganter, um, who I absolutely believe is the best person for this job. And she has um, a lot of work ahead of her. And if I can help her by, oh, I don't know, meeting up after work in Davis where we both live, by golly, I'm up for it. Um, and I know you'll do great things, Allison. Um, I have one more introduction of a new member of the BSCC team. There she is. 
<laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> um, just after our July board meeting, uh, the governor appointed Jana Sanford Miller as our, our director of communications and external affairs. And that was another thing I wanted to finish before I left. So um, it's really uh, one of the poignant, I'm going to talk about the dialectic, like I feel this and that and up and down and in and out. But, um, you know, to have been able to uh, help get Allison into her new role and to bring Jana onto the team and to have recently promoted uh, Casey and then to say, okay, bye, I'm out of here. It really feels strange. But I want to tell you a little bit about Jana and you'll hear more from her a little later on the agenda today. She's going to be presenting the report to you on um, the strategic plan. But uh, Jana has 24 years and counting in public service so far. She's worked in administration, policy, research, and communications subject matter areas. She began her career as a legislative staffer in the California Assembly. She, for many years, taught communication studies at CSU Stanislaus, where she also earned her master's degree. And for the last 10 years, she was at CDCR, most recently uh, was the acting deputy director for the Office of Research. So she brings just a ton of um, expertise and skills and, and great energy to the role. Um, so welcome, Jana. And goodbye. Um, oh <laughs> you see how that feels? Not great. Um, <laughs> so I have a couple of business updates for you. Um, thanks to Adam, we recently completed um, two of the required legislative reports. The Community Corrections Partnership Plan um, was turned into the governor and the legislature. And we also had a one-time report on the Youth Programs and Facilities Grant uh, program, which was administered as part of SB 823, DJJ realignment. So that report was um, turned into the legislature. Um, speaking of legislative updates, we have uh, uh, in your information items in your binders, there's the end of the session wrap that Adam put together on bills that were of interest. I also want to talk a little bit about um, a recent article that you may have seen in Cal Matters. Um, the topic was uh, the really outstanding report that um, our research team made on the rates of recidivism in Prop 47 programs. And you may remember, those of you who are on the board, you know, old timers like Sheriff Taylor, um, <laughs> um, our fantastic research team engaged in um, a really uh, uh, a really helpful review of people's experiences during the Prop 47. And I'll just tell you, Linda, I didn't take my anti-eye roll medication today, because I, I I know I'm just going to let it fly a little bit today. Um, you know, when you, when you read a news story about a report that you have some familiarity with and you see it sort of like incorrectly characterized, it can just kind of be frustrating. So if you're listening, Cal Matters, as we stated in the report, it was not a three-year review of rates of recidivism because the report was by definition, focused on people's experiences and whether there was recidivism during the time period that they were receiving services under Prop 47. And I think, Scott, you probably got some questions on this as well. Um, so that's not what we were tracking. So that's not what we were reporting on. Um, in addition, I would note, because this agency was charged when, when Linda and I were new in our roles um, in 2011, I think a bill passed for the BSCC to establish a standard definition of recidivism for the state's use. And we did that um, and did come up with what we have always referred to as a top line definition of recidivism, which is, was a person uh, convicted of a subsequent crime after either leaving custody or whatever that first part of the, um, so here I am being casual with the definition. It's really important, trust me. Um, but we always said that was the top line definition because those data sets are actually publicly available and consistently you know, can be um, assessed. Um, but when you think about the delivery of services within a grant program that may only last three years, you're not gonna have a start time that allows you to get all the way to three years. Somebody may come into the program and have services for 12 months. So you sort of work with the data that you that you can. Um, again, our terrific um, research team and my colleague Stacy Riley is working on um, planning stages of a project to, to actually get three-year recidivism data um, over time. And there's a lot of work that goes into that. We need to partner with DOJ and grantees and others, and there are, you know, there are data hurdles to work through. Um, and I feel like that's probably all I need to say on that. Probably, probably more than I needed to say. Yeah. Uh -huh. All right. Um, so <laughs> here we go. So um, 
if there just do the board members have any questions about that the prop 47 thing or anything else yeah my only question is in reading that cal matters article thank you for addressing the three-year yeah. issue because i do think if we're telling the world that's what we think the top line definition of recidivism is it's what we should be tracking yeah um so i'm glad we're doing that um there was one thing i read in the article where it said it didn't track convictions outside of the county oh uh-huh yes. and that feels yeah that feels disingenuous mm -hmm. so why would we not track convictions outside of one county um these are some of the data limitations that um make it really really difficult to get that data and i think this subsequent work and i'll, I'll ask casey to be ready to jump up because she can answer the question better um i think as we look at ways to track data specific to a person across you know multiple jurisdictions counties and so on we want to be able to have more information to report on recidivism but there are inherent limitations in how those data can be collected and tracked casey would you want someone to elaborate on that for me sure Hi. Hey. um within the grant period getting um statewide data requires going to the california department of justice and getting permission for going through their application process to um, obtain that data from them. So within the window of a grant period, initiating that research design um, is very resource intensive for every single grantee to do that. So most grantees will establish a data sharing agreement with a local law enforcement agency who has access to that data Again, though, it would just be within the county. So for the work that it takes to establish that research partnership with DOJ to obtain the data for participants who at one point may only have enrolled in that third year of the grant program is quite a heavy lift when you can't even track the recidivism for three years on all of those participants. So um, within this period of the grant funding, it's just really cumbersome to do that and get the data at a statewide level. That's why we're currently working on a project to do that with grantees um, with the BSCC involved. Got it. The article called the data that we're getting diluted. Do you think that's an unfair assessment? Yes, I do. Okay. I do, because you one would have to engage in the conversation of, is three-year data available? Yes, no, no. Okay, so then look at other measures and define those other measures that you're looking at. And I think we did that in the clearest way possible uh, in the report itself. And I feel like, well, okay, I'll stop there. Do, Aaron, do you, you think that other than just government bureaucracy, it should be easier for a body like this and an organization like the DOJ to have a much simpler way of agreeing on getting data. The, these are, there's there are legends. I'm I'm looking at Judge Gard, who worked for DOJ for many years. The data are appropriately, I would say, kept very secure, and it has historically um, been a point of um, some 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 difficulty to get those data agreements. Um, executed. Over the years, I would say we've had a pretty good working relationship with DOJ. Um, but I guess I would I guess I would just say that again. They they do hold that data very close so that it's not, you know, misused. It's 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 sort of difficult to get on purpose, I would say. And I don't know, Janet, if you want to add any thoughts on that. Or oh, there. <laughs> yeah, it I mean it, it, it we don't have this we don't have secure systems here at the BSCC to house the data itself. So we have to rely on the information that DOJ has and it takes, it just takes a really long time to get that information. They get a lot of requests from a lot of different entities. Got it. And can I just say one thing, Scott, even locally for us to be able to establish recidivism, recidivism data outside of, you know, what we can generate locally from whether it be from the sheriff or from uh, the, the other law enforcement agencies in the county. Um, DOJ information is hard to, if not impossible, unless you have a purpose behind why are you requesting that information. So unless you are, are writing a new pre-sentence report or there's something new, a new crime has been committed and we're having to do an investigation on it. Um, 
that those are the kind of things that DOJ will allow us to be able to pull data from that. But to do an exercise in trying to find out if someone had a new conviction a year after they came off of, of supervision, um, right now, the, the regs doesn't allow us to, to be able to do that even locally to, to be able to pull that. So we're even bound by what um, the report is talking about by just local um, uh, information in order to kind of build that out. And, and I'll say, Scott, I chaired the executive steering committee along with Ricardo Goodrich that established the definition of recidivism so many years ago. And uh, those were many of the conversations surrounded being able to capture accurate statewide data. And uh, we did not want to build a definition uh, that we knew we couldn't capture uh, appropriate data associated with it. So um, it, it was, a, and it was a long, arduous process to come up with the definition. And um, while it's not perfect, um, we built it so we could ensure the information we got was accurate and uh, demonstrated actually what was going on. I mean, I think people could continuously ask for broader depth and breadth of the information spanning every county, spanning a country and looking at recidivism, but um, we weren't capable of those kinds of data points. Is that a fair statement, Katie? That was many years ago. And we have, you know, we're working towards uh, better data on a regular basis, but we still are uh, a state with 58 counties and many, many, um, small municipalities and collecting the data it just presents huge, enormous hurdles. Scott, anything else? Nothing for me. I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, I was able to chat with Katie about it and it was, it was very helpful. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I think I just want to say a few things um, and start with how very, very grateful I am for having had this opportunity. Over the last 11 years, it turns out by coincidence, it's 11 years to the day. Um, I took my oath on October 3rd, 2013 um, for this job. Yeah, we were, we were all a little bit younger then. Um, and it has been uh, an absolutely wonderful experience. I feel like um, the time has flown by in the blink of an eye and also <laughs> it's been a long strange trip <laughs> um, but really uh, the opportunity to work with um, this board um, it, it goes without saying my my uh, working relationship with Linda Penner has been absolutely incredible uh, we have worked through many 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 different kinds of issues and challenges and I, I've told Linda this many times um, we don't always agree um, and I have learned more about working through um, differences of opinion and perspective um, with Linda than really pretty much any other relationship <laughs> in my life. Um, and I just value that and we'll, we'll treasure it always um, to um, certainly to board member Scott Budnick, who is already here when I started. It's just been absolutely wonderful. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, you had just yeah you had just been appointed by the assembly, I think, a few months earlier. Yeah, so you're the OG. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, for all of those of you who are new, the the work of this board is really, really important. And you know, I, I announced my retirement to all of you last Friday. Um, it, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty heady, actually, to you know to hear from all kinds of people near and far, and I, I received a lot of affirmation about the kinds of things that are most important to me, which is to work really hard um, to improve systems from the inside. Um, and I think that that has to be done by being thoughtful and careful and open to different perspectives and um, all the rest. And then the people here at the BSCC, and it's, it's really interesting, I do sort of feel like I'm I'm not going to cry, which maybe that will change in a minute. But right now, I just feel my heart is absolutely full to bursting with appreciation and gratitude um, for this team. And I could start naming names, but then I would have to stop. And there are about 145 employees here at the BSCC. So to each and every one of you, um, I value the work that you do um, and the huge commitments that you make. And, and thank you for all of that. So... Um, you know, I found out that um, 
where I am <laughs> in terms of retirement eligibility is is kind of nice. And I, I also thank the state of California. I was talking with Janet about that earlier. I mean, we've all had different sorts of jobs. And this has been a very, very, very rewarding career for me. I, I think I pretty much had the career I pictured when I was, you know, 11 years old and had a clipboard and liked to, you know, be sure everybody knew what the rules were. Um, so you can see, <laughs> I just stepped right into that dream. Um, and now I'm ready to see who I am when I'm not walking around with a clipboard. Um, so that also feels really, really good. Um, I still will be, you know, in, in the world doing things. I just don't know what yet. I plan to chill hard for the next few months and, and figure all of that out. Um, so you can see, I didn't really prepare remarks. I just wanted to tell you, you know, from my heart, how grateful I am to all of you, how even more grateful, quite honestly, I am to the BSCC staff and how wonderful you all are and that I'll miss you very much. And please don't lose my phone number. And um, thank you. Thank you, Katie. Um, we're gonna recognize Katie uh, in many ways uh, during this meeting a bit, after the meeting a bit more, and then uh, through the evening. But uh, right now, I think it's appropriate um, to, I would like to read from a um, a plaque that we made, Katie, and and uh, uh, because it sort of sums up some things uh, about her uh, on an official note, and then I'm going to do the emotional note after that. And she has served this board, as she has noted, uh, since 2012. And the plaque says, in recognition of 12 years of exemplary, ser exemplary service to the Board of State and Community Corrections, we extend our deepest gratitude for your unwavering dedication and visionary leadership as the executive director. Your steadfast commitment to the people of California has been invaluable. Leaving an indelible mark on both our agency and uh, the agencies we serve. Your leadership has not only guided the success and growth of the Board of State Community Corrections, but it has also been instrumental in fostering innovative programs. While your departure leaves a void, it will be deeply felt by your colleagues for some time. Your enduring legacy, legacy will continue to inspire and shape the future of the state of California for years to come. Those remarks are so important because um, it's in incredibly um, accurate. Uh, Katie, um, as she talks about, you know, she and I, you know, doing a bit of the push, push and pull, and by the way, remaining good friends all the way through it, um, is a visionary. And um, she's taught me a great deal about looking at things from different perspectives. Um, and you can't ask for more of a colleague that uh, will do the dance with you to come up with a product that serves the state and serves our agency as well. And I uh, forever will value you for that. With all that said, on a professional sort of uh, view of you and uh, your brilliance and uh, how quick you are to spot any grammatical error in the whole world. And you know, she literally hates on words. I never knew anybody that hated on words and I'm surrounded by Aaron and Katie now who just hate on words that are used inappropriately. That could be a little intimidating at times. But bigger than that, Katie, you are a leader on such an extraordinary personal level. You care about people. You bring them along. You gather them. You communicate well with them. But you're able to uh, push them to get the job done and, and do the right thing with efficiency and accuracy. Uh, those are rare finds in uh the professional world. So I'm delighted to have spent this kind of time with you. I was really only going to keep this job for one year. I, I committed to Governor Brown. I'll stay one year and then I'm out of here. And uh, a lot of why, yeah, I'm a big old liar. But you know, Katie had a lot to do with that. And the work of the board had a lot to do with that. So on a personal and professional level, Katie, you're a big deal. Let's pretend we hand this off. You haven't seen it before. <laughs>
Confirm. Thank you, Aaron. We just got um, the communication this morning affirming that Aaron McGuire has been appointed acting executive director here at the BSCC. And that's really good news. Um, it, it has been seriously a professional highlight for me to get to work with Aaron McGuire these last, it's, is it eight years? It'll be nine years in February. Um, you know, just all of the things, uh, brilliant, thoughtful, um, interested in making sure that we have all the information before jumping to a decision, which might be something he needs to do with me sometimes. Like, we have to move. No, not necessarily. <laughs> Let's <laughs> think it through. Um, and so I'm really, really happy that Aaron is stepping into this role. And um, it's my hope that he will be here for just as long as he may want to be. Um, and he's an absolutely terrific colleague and I know will serve the board very, very well in that new capacity. Thank you. Any, any of the board members like to say anything? I would just like to say the excellence with which you have carried out your duties over the years and working with you are deeply appreciated. Um, and I know that I'm not the only chief that feels that way. Thank you for working through a lot of difficult situations and helping to make our professions better. Thank you very much, Chief. Katie, <clears throat> Katie it's um, a rare person who I think can start a program or a, a new office or a new agency from the ground up and to remain there for a decade or more. And so it's just a, just an, a tribute to the work that you've done, the, the, you know, just the care that you've had as the state of California has made, you know, tremendous changes. And uh, BSCC has been at the forefront of that. And, and because of your leadership, um, you know, we've been able to, as a state, to be able to carry through and carry out successfully um, all these things that um, are making uh, the work that we do with our youth and our adults so much better. So I just want to say thank you for your commitment, for all you've done, and to just wish you well in your retirement. And congratulations to Aaron, too. Thank you so much, Chief. Norma. Katie, yep. um, I just want to thank you for all of your support and <clears throat> guidance throughout these years. Um, I still remember when you went and picked me up at the airport on my first day, that was before COVID. Mm -hmm. We didn't know what was coming. And then I thought, oh, they sent someone to pick me up, to check me out before I get <laughs> there. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> so I always remember that. And I really appreciate you and the way that you show up here and the way that we've been able to really discuss matters and talk about things and see things from both sides. So thank you so much. I know we'll be in touch, but thank you for everything. And congratulations, Aaron. I look forward to this new phase. Thank you, Norma. I'll jump in real quick. Um, so I think it's incredible what you've been able to do with the BACC the amount of pivots you've had to make and just how it's evolved over the years and the things that have been thrown at you. I, but what I really wanna to speak to is um, preparing to go through the Senate confirmation hearing. Um, one of the questions of, on the questionnaire that I just had to fill out was how was my onboarding process here? And I can't say enough about how incredibly supportive you've been and the staff have been, the communication, the welcome, the help, the support has just been incredible. And so the transition coming onto this board has been an absolute pleasure because of you and your staff and, and congratulations also to Aaron and for all your help. I just, I, I wish people would know like truly how much the staff here really takes this job to heart and how supportive and welcoming they are and how they all want us to be successful. Um, and I'm, Good luck in your retirement, and I hope uh, we don't lose touch. Thank you very much, Sheriff. Oh, wait. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, when Aaron and I were at the Department of Justice and Katie was at the Judicial Council, and unlike everyone else on the board, I'm not appointed by the governor. I'm appointed by the Chief Justice and for, um, on behalf of the Judicial Council. And about five years ago, I got a call from a friend who I had worked with, who Katie had worked with at the Judicial Council. 
and she tried to talk me into coming on the board. She told me about all the good work, but I am retired. I actually work a lot more than I would like to. But she said, well, one more thing, you know, the executive chair is Katie and Aaron is the, or is the executive, um, is Katie and Aaron is a team. And that was enough to put me over it because I knew that it would be a phenomenal experience based on everything that we had done together. And um, I was thinking before I got the announcement last week, so I am um, meeting next week, but we just met two weeks ago for the ESC for the CalVIP grant. And what a phenomenal team that is, I have to say. But that has been my experience with everything with regard to this board. The staff are all phenomenal, and that comes from the top. It comes from nurturing people and supporting people and guiding people. And you two have been a phenomenal team. So Katie, as I told you earlier, I am so happy for you. Um, and Erin, I'm really happy for you too. Well behaved by you. Thank you very much. I never heard that story about, uh, yeah, the, I yeah, I do, I do, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Janet. Um, I just wanna echo a lot of what Sheriff Taylor and Norma said. Sure. I've learned so much from you. Um, this is this is a complicated organization and how you're able to navigate it all um, as well as like keep an even keel and continue to teach us. Even hearing our chair say she's learned so much and has evolved so much from her working relationship with you. Um, it really shows the impact that you've had uh, on this organization. So um, it's gonna be a bummer not seeing you as much, but I'm like, I'm very, very, very happy for you and excited for whatever your new endeavors are going to be. So I really appreciate you. Thank you very much, Scott. And I won't lose your number. Get ready, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the truth. That's beautiful. To the new board members, uh, we don't usually have this much pomp and circumstance as we start a meeting, right. uh, but I, I was, uh, thinking that you must glean from the remarks made by individuals, both on behalf of Katie, Aaron, Allison, um, that there is uh, a lot of hard work that goes on here, a lot of staff that is extremely helpful as that work moves forward. And I think when you hear where uh, board members have their areas of expertise and uh, how well um, uh, this, I guess I want to say well staffed this board is, but what I mean to say is that the appointments that are made are meaningful and there are people with a great deal of experience and everybody brings something new, uh, uh, a, a new perspective to the table as we come along. And uh, the reason we're all you know, sad today is because Katie was able to take all of that energy from all these emphasis and turn it into you know, amazing products. And most of the time she had a smile on her face while she was doing it. So. <laughs> Um, I hope that uh, you're learning from this moment and um, maybe we'll add a lot of ceremonies at the beginning of every meeting. That could be good. It really is uplifting. With that said, um, Katie, anything else you want to say? Um, I really do want to wish my really good friend and colleague Aaron all the best in his new role. Um, I'm not going far and I'm, I'm happy to help in any ways that I can, but you don't need my help. You got this. It's, it's going to be absolutely amazing. Um, I'm really curious about how it's going to feel, you know, a couple of weeks from now. I'm doing a couple of little teeny trips and travel. Um, I know I have friends and family uh, watching on Zoom today, so they're in my heart right now um, because I want to kind of figure out who I am <laughs> when I'm not at work. Um, Nick and Maggie, most importantly, my children, I love you so much. And um, this is a big day for me. Yeah. So thanks for all the support. Oh. Oh. I don't think I can say anything better than that. Thank you, Katie. And and to you, Aaron, delighted that um, you're the interim. And of course, we hope for an enduring career for you in this job. And um, But it's not up to us. Uh, you are up for this job. You're a special individual. And for the continuity of this agency, we're just delighted you're here to, to keep us uh, rowing forward. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I really appreciate it. I appreciate your support. I appreciate uh, the board support. I appreciate all the staff support. Um, Katie has assembled an amazing, phenomenal management team, um, and I feel very fortunate and grateful to be part of it. I, I want to touch on uh, Judge Gard's story a little bit, which is 
Katie and I really didn't know each other while I was at while I was at DOJ. We were like in parallel paths. We had a very uh, good mutual friend, which was June Clark, of course. And it, we blame June for all of this, all all of this misfortune. Yeah. Uh, but and and really, when I came over here and Linda recruited me over here, and I, you know, I think Katie was like, I'm, I don't, I don't know this guy very well. I've kind of heard about him and and things like that. And um, but I will say, over the last uh, several years, um, I I couldn't. And this is awkward because I'm gonna. I, I don't want to say it's the best boss I've ever had. <laughs> You're certainly the longest boss I've ever had before. Um, but um, I I I I just have so valued um, the partnership that we have had in this job together, and I have learned. Uh, an incredible amount uh, working with you, seeing how you work, uh, working with Linda uh, to work things out, as we like to say. And um, I'm just very grateful to be here and to, uh, you know, the the hard part, of course, is is coming uh, coming after the person who sets the standard. And I hope to people don't look back and go, you know, it was so much better. <laughs> that's, not good. that's not good. I hope that's not the case. Um, but I'm so glad to be here and again with the team and I wish you uh, all the best. Thank you. All right. We'll turn directly uh, to Aaron for any legal update you'd like to provide. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I sent a memo early this morning to your email that, and I anticipate that we will probably have a closed session at the next board meeting. If you have any questions about that memo, please feel free to reach out to me directly. And then the other item in terms of legal update, uh, you may notice that we are making grant awards today um, in on the agenda. So please make sure you review that list of grantees that are proposed to be awarded and that if uh, you are a department or an employee or sit on a board of directors that may be receiving that funding, that we would ask that you would recuse when we get to that item. Uh, I would flag for Chief Scott that uh, the city and county of San Francisco is going to be uh, proposed to be awarded some funding. So we would ask when we get to that agenda item that you step out of the room when we take that item up. But I think that's the only one that I could see. But uh, as a reminder, please review those proposed grantees and flag if you believe you may or may have a conflict or have a question about the awards that are being made. Other than that, I think that's my report, Madam Chair. Thank, Thank you. you. And Adam, on the legal wrap-up? Um, please refer to your handouts okay. in your book. All right. Thank you. I, I should say the legislative wrap-up. Um, we're now moving to uh, item three on the agenda, the consent items. That is item A through D. If you would take a quick look at those agenda items, I'd ask if anybody would want to pull one of those items uh, from the agenda or if we may adopt the slate as it stands. Seeing none, anybody from uh, the audience in the room want to pull a, an item or our virtual audience audience like to pull an item from the consent agenda for consideration or discussion? Adam, anyone? Um, in the public, we had two hands raised. That was Paloma and Sabrina, but they have put down their hands. Do they still want to speak? If so, please raise your hands now and I'll call on you. And they did not re-raise their hand, so no public comments or okay. consent items. Uh, regarding the consent items, I'd ask for a uh, motion or a second? Motion. Second? Second. With motion and second, Adam, please take the roll. Chair Penner? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. Mr. Haynes? Aye. Ms. Corpus? Aye. Mr. Taylor? Aye. Ms. Branning? Aye. Ms. Gard? Aye. Mr. Scott? Aye. Mr. Budnick? Aye. Ms. Zaragoza? Aye. Ms. Kumpion? Aye. Ms. Lai? Aye. Madam Chair, the motion carries for consent items A through D. Thank you. Uh, now to uh, action items on the agenda. I'm sorry, discussion items on the agenda. I'm sorry. Action items for discussion. Uh, I'd like to move to item E, and that is the launch of our uh, strategic plan. And I see our newest communications director coming. Uh, welcome, Jonna. Yes, thank you. Give me one quick second. All right. 
set up. So good morning, Madam Chair and members of the board. Um, as Katie introduced, I am Jana Sanford Miller, the new Communications and External Affairs Director for the BSCC. I certainly appreciate the opportunity to serve in this capacity, and I'm excited to be a part of this amazing team that Katie has built. Um, I feel like it's a little bit of a bait and switch, but I'm very glad I'm here. <laughs> So I'm here today to request uh, approval to launch a new strategic plan process. Um, so first, allow me to provide a little bit of background. So the current strategic plan was developed over a 10 month period in 2021 with an effective date of January 2022 to December 2026. So as you can see, we are still within the time for excuse me, the timeline of the current plan. However, we are recommending a new strategic planning process for a few reasons. So as you can see, the, uh, we have experienced significant policy and organizational changes since 2021, beginning with two new board positions, uh, a licensed healthcare provider and a licensed mental or behavioral health provider. Um, there have also been changes to individual board membership. Um, so not only have board seats expanded from 13 to 15 board members, the people sitting in those seats have also changed. In fact, only five of the current members of the board were part of the 2021 process. Of course, a broadening of the board mission brought into effect by Senate Bill 519. Um, as you are aware, Senate Bill 519 established a new governor appointed position, the in custody death review director, who we all heard from earlier today. And congratulations again, Allison. Subsequently, an entirely new division has been brought forth by SB 519 to the board along with this director um, spot. So we know these are very important new responsibilities here at the BSCC, um, and we believe they sh those should be incorporated into the strategic plan. Uh, finally, the executive order on diversity, equity, and inclusion. While DEI has been a part of the operations at the BSCC across all divisions, um, this specific executive order directed state agencies to include the use of equity or data analysis and inclusive practices into their strategic plans uh, with the goal of effectively identifying disparities and advancing equity. So with all of these changes, bottom line, we are recommending a new strategic planning process. So what will this look like or what will the process be that we will follow to develop the new strategic plan? First step, establish goals. So the strategic planning process will begin with the development of clear organizational goals and priorities that will consider input from the board as well as stakeholder groups and the interested public. There will be listening sessions and other opportunities for input that we will share on our website. Second step, identify our objectives. Objectives are specific and measurable actions that are aligned with the identified vision and goals. Uh, excuse me, objectives will be defined for each program area. Third step, strategies, measurements, measures, excuse me, and targets. BSCC program staff and other experts will develop specific strategies for each objective, as well as performance indicators to measure our success. And the fourth and final step will be board approval. Once the plan is approved by the board, BSC st BSCC staff will regularly assess and report progress to the board and make adjustments as necessary. 
So while I've provided background and the purpose of developing a new strategic plan, as well as a general overview of the process we intend to follow, the next slide provides an anticipated timeline for when the plan will be ready for board consideration. Uh, starting, of course, with the first step, goals, developing our goals. Um, we anticipate that to occur in December of 2024, so we're going to hit the ground running. Um, with objectives to follow in the spring of 2025. Finally, or excuse me, strategies next in uh, we, which we anticipate in the summer of 2025. Um, and then finally, we anticipate um, the strategic plan will be ready for board consideration right around September of next year. So right about a 10 month process. And once we receive board approval for the strategic plan, next year, we will begin looking at outcomes immediately or how successful we are at meeting our performance goals and will provide regular updates to the board through conclusion of the plan. Thank you. Thank you. Any, anyone from the board wish to make any comments or have any questions? How good you are, John. And anyone in the public, Adam? I do have one member um, from the public. Um, if we could get the timer up. All right, and that will be Yusuf Miller. Yusuf, I will unmute you. Please go ahead and speak. You have two minutes. Yes, my name is Yusef Miller of the North County Equity and Justice Coalition Saving Lives in Custody Campaign out of San Diego, California, and with the Saving Lives in Custody California. Um, I really appreciate hearing the DEI lens on the strategic plan, and it's re really important to make sure that we're looking at equity and inclusion in these kinds of studies and data and strategic plans. Um, that was really all I had for this particular one, but I did try to raise my hand for the public comment and wasn't able to. So whenever that's appropriate, I would like to give uh, a public comment statement, and that, that'll be all for now. Thank you. Thank you. That's all for public comment, okay. Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, back to the board, anything? Uh, may I have a motion and a second? Motion to approve. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Adam? Chair Penner? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. Mr. Haynes? Aye. Ms. Corpus? Aye. Mr. Taylor? Aye. Ms. Branning? Aye. Ms. Gard? Aye. Mr. Scott? Aye. Mr. Budnick? Aye. Ms. Zaragoza? Aye. Ms. Kumpion? Aye. And Ms. Lai? Aye. Madam Chair, the motion carries for agenda item E. Thank you, thank you. Let the record reflect uh, Jana's first uh, item before the board went smashingly. Good to have you on board. I see Casey has already uh, made her approach. She is going to present on the uh, opioids in local detention facilities. Good to see you, Casey. Casey was able to observe uh, Katie and I have an exchange just this week. So, you know, she's, she's, she's a veteran. She was grinning very big when you were making those remarks earlier. I will miss the entertainment. Yes. <laughs> All right. Good morning, uh, Madam Chair and board members and Casey Warman. Deputy Director for the Research and Standards and Training for Corrections Division. Agenda item F presents a summary of the information gathered through the Opioid Antagonist and Local Detention Facilities Survey and requests approval to refer the information gathered to the In-Custody Death Review Division for consideration. The survey was designed to gather information related to opioids and opioid overdoses in each adult and juvenile local detention facility. It was also designed to help gain a better understanding of the operations of the local detention facilities related to the occurrence of opioid overdoses by collecting information related to the availability of opioid antagonists within the facility. An opioid antagonist is medication that reverses respiratory depression during an over opioid overdose. There are several types 
the most commonly known type is referred to as Narcan. So in addition to the availability of the opioid antagonists, we also gathered information about how frequently they are used, the number of successful interventions, and how opioids are introduced into the facilities. The survey also gathered information about the training of facility staff for their use and other substance use related practices. Each sheriff department and probation department were requested to provide a survey response for each facility in operation for two administrations. The first administration gathered data for the first three months of the year, and the second gathered data for uh, April through June of this year. So combined, we have collected six months of data, and following this presentation, we will be seeking your input on next steps. Before I begin um, and share these results, I wanna thank each sheriff and probation department for responding to the survey. It is a voluntary survey, and their data reporters were very responsive to our follow-up requests to uh, help clarify the data as well. And also I'd like to thank the research staff who made all of this possible and this presentation possible, Michael Lee and Megan Jones. They were uh, on the call, on the phone, frequently clarifying data and very grateful to them. Okay, so I will begin first with the adult detention facilities. I am happy to report that we received an excellent response rate to the survey. While there are 120 local adult detention facilities at the time of the survey administration, 113 were occupied. And we did receive a response from all 113 facilities. And all of these facilities have opioid antagonists available within the facility. The survey requested data for the instances of opioid antagonist use and successful interventions for the first six months of 2024. And you may be wondering, what do we mean by an instance of opioid antagonist use? So one instance represents one person who was administered at least one and possibly multiple doses of an opioid antagonist. So between uh, January and the end of June, there were 581 unique incidents of opioid antagonist use with 574 successful interventions. This provides a 99% successful intervention rate. The seven unique incidents that did not result in successful interventions were confirmed by research staff to be opioid related deaths. The survey also requested a variety of information related to opioid antagonist accessibility and training. Again, 100% of the reporting facilities have opioid antagonists accessible to custodial staff, and all of the facilities indicated that they provide training to staff for the administration of those. Additionally, 67% of the facilities reported that the opioid antagonists are physically on custodial staff at all times. So this would be, for example, on their duty belts. And 27% of the reporting facilities indicated that opioid antagonists are accessible to people who are detained. So this would be within housing units or common areas. And for those facilities that do provide opioid antagonists to the people who are detained, um, most of those facilities provide training on the administration of those through educational materials that are posted throughout the facility. In regard to the common methods for the introduction of opioids into facilities, for the first six months of the year, there were 1,003 known incidents of opioid introduction. Of these, 47% were through mail or package deliveries, 46% were through people who are detained, and less than 1% were through custodial staff, and this would be combined for both sworn and non-sworn custodial staff. A variety of information related to substance use related practice and policy was also collected. This detailed information is on the handout on the uh, webpage for the survey. 
But to summarize, 94% of the reporting facilities assess whether people have an ongoing substance use disorder at the time of booking. 48% house people in a designated area when they are being monitored for withdrawal. And 84% have a medication assisted treatment or MAP program for the people who are detained. So moving on to the results for the juvenile detention facilities, once again, we received a 100% response rate. There are 132 local detention facilities. At the time of the survey administration, 128 were occupied. And we did receive a response from all 28 and are happy to report that all of these facilities have opioid antagonists available within them. For the incidence of opioid antagonist use, for the first six months of 2004, there were five unique incidents of opioid antagonist use with a 100% successful intervention rate. For opioid antagonist accessibility and training, 91% of the facilities reported that opioid antagonists are accessible by youth supervision staff. 41% of the facilities indicate that these opioid antagonists are always on youth supervision staff, so on their duty belts. And 94% of the facilities report that the opioid antagonists are accessible by facility medical staff. And 96% of the facilities provide training or education on the administration of opioid antagonists. In regards to the common methods for the introduction of opioids into facilities, for the first six months of the year, there were 24 known instances of opioid introduction. 54% were through youth who were detained, 21% were through mail or package deliveries, and 13% were through visitors of the youth who were detained. Uh, I do need to note that these figures do not include data from Los Angeles Los Padrinos Juvenile Hall. Uh, this facility reported the data is unavailable. And I did forget to mention for the adult data, this data was uh, not available for the nine Los Angeles Sheriff's Department's facilities. Apologies there. So in regard to substance use related practice and policy for the juvenile facilities, 91% of these facilities assess whether youth have an ongoing substance use disorder at the time of intake. 42% of the facilities house youth within a designated area when they are being monitored for withdrawal. And 61% of the facilities have a MAP program for the youth who are detained. This concludes the summary of the opioid survey results for uh, both adult and juvenile detention facilities. The information received in the two quarters of data collection provides a helpful snapshot of current practices around the state. With regard to the survey findings, the staff recommends the following. Uh, one, the board defer further action until the in-custody death review division is established and can review the results for possible regulation recommendations or whether further information from the facilities is needed. And two, the board end this data collection effort with the already completed second administration. This concludes my presentation, and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you, Casey. Any members of the board have questions or comments? Adam, looking to you for members of the public, either in the room or virtually. So on Zoom, we have three members of the public. Um, if we could get the timer up. And I'm going to call the first one, and you will have two minutes. Yusuf? Yes, this is Yusuf Miller, North County Equity and Justice Coalition, Saving Lives in Custody Campaign out of San Diego Ooh. County. And thank you for this presentation on opioids in the uh, jail facilities. Um, one of the things that I noticed is that we have the 1% on the staff and, and, and deputies that are entering the jails, but I think that that number is, is based on us not even really screening them. In San Diego County, we just started as of, uh, I think it was July, 
the the screening of the San Diego jail facilities, uh, one facility at a time in a random uh, sort of situation there. But um, that is inadequate. Also, we, we need to uh, have the manpower and, or staff power to and and dogs to really scan uh, people from coming in every contact because this is a crisis. So although I, I would hope that uh, staff and and um, deputies are not bringing in drugs in, in those things, but that's just not the reality. When we look at San Diego County, we have two deputies that were had drug related uh, offenses even on the property. So I think we need to invest more into uh, putting aside the idea that uh, some people are beyond approach for scanning and in involvement with uh, either dogs or or scanning machines. And if we're already doing that, that's great. But I think it's something that we have to consider and we have to make sure that it's universal to make 100% contact with our people who are coming in contact with our loved ones, not just the inmate themselves and not just the visitors of those people. This is all great, along with the, uh, with the mail that's coming in, that's all great, but also the sworn staff and and also everyone that comes in and out of the jails. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Cheryl um, Kenton. Cheryl, please go ahead. You have two minutes. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I'm not sure if it's the, the, um, the topic right now, but I just know that my son is in a state facility and this is a state um, oversight uh, board. So my son uh, called me, he suffered, he has a diagnosis of bipolar and he called me really frantic and really feeling unsafe. And uh, he, he needed help immediate and uh, had me, he was barricaded in his cell and saying that he gave me the name of the uh, CO Duran and said that he was telling the other uh, PIs that um, stuff about him and setting him up to, to, to be killed. And he re was really uh, feeling unsafe. So I called, I made many calls and some of them with him on the call to, to complain himself and he would not let me hang up. So as I saw him on the phone for, had me on the phone for hours, I asked him, son, how, how are you on the phone for hours and nothing's happening? His, I, I, and so I start to realize that maybe he was being paranoid and delusional and in a crisis right then. Um, he said, I said, son, uh, ask for help. Um, say that you need medical help. He said, they're all in this together. I'm not, I'm not gonna ask these people for help. They're against me. They're, they're trying to set me up to be killed. And so, and he was, re he was prepared to respond to that. So you can imagine how I felt right then um, like I said, I made a call to prison law office, uh, friends outside, um, the ombudsman, everybody that I could think of, but it was like four o'clock after hours. I couldn't get any response. Anyone answered from the jail, the Kern Valley State Prison. Your two I minutes get... is up. Thank you, Cheryl. Next, we have um, Paloma. Hello, my name is Paloma Serna. I am with the North County Equity and Justice Coalition of San Diego and a Saving Life in Custody, California. My uh, my daughter, Elisa Serna, died at the Las Colinas Jail in San Diego on November 11, 2019. She was um, killed there by the deputies and medical staff for neglect. Uh, she was in custody only for five days. And also, too, I would like to echo what Yusuf Miller had stated, you know, um, these numbers that are being presented, you know, by the surveys, it is, you know, I question, though, just because it is the sheriffs that are completing these uh, surveys, and I don't really um, trust in those numbers. You know, I know the sheriff, they like to uh, blame uh, they cut the, the inmates for um, the drugs being brought into the jails. But here last year in San Diego, you know, Yusuf Miller did uh, mention about the deputies that had drugs on them or on the property. Alan, uh, were 
Where's it? Where I can't. I'm sorry, I can't even spell his last name. It's W E R E S K I. I'm so bad with names. He was arrested, and also he attended his court hearing under the influence, and he was only given probation. You know, and I don't think this is right. It it just shows it 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 gives a message to the deputies that they're kind of like invincible. So I do believe that the sheriff department are aware that there are more deputies and maybe medical staff bringing in the drugs. They need to scan their deputies. Kelly Martino is so concerned about radiation. I mean, how do these people enter court or even fly on vacation? I uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, is there anyone in the room that would like to make a public comment? Please proceed to the podium. And we have none. Can Madam I comment? Oh, uh, yes. Back to the board, Scott. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say to the mom mm -hmm. that, that made the comment, I think your name was Cheryl. Um, I can't imagine what that must feel like uh, for a mom not being able to help your son uh, through whatever the crisis may be, whether it's a mental health crisis or whether he's actually um, in danger from others. So um, I, I just visited Kern Valley State Prison. Uh, there's a new warden there. He's making a lot of changes. So if you email me or the BSEC and they'll get it to me. Um, I can give your son's information to the ward and just have him look into it. Thank you, Scott, super helpful. That's it for public comments. Certainly wanna be compassionate about what Cheryl was saying and the one on her uh, behalf of her son. Uh, back to the board, any, any other questions, comments? At this point in time, uh, we would want to adopt the recommendations Oh, I'm sorry. I'm yeah. sorry. I do. Ha I have a question. Can you all hear me? Okay. Uh -huh. Okay, great. Um, I see the recommendation is to defer action until the in custody death review division is established and can review the findings. What does that timeline look like? And will this be agendized again so that we can get, you know, some updates from them? Uh, I mean, Allison can comment. I, I think I can cover most of that question, which is uh, it, the establishment of that division is ongoing. Allison's on board now. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, remembering when we uh, began this project, it was for a snapshot of what was going on throughout the state in terms of uh, this important issue. And I think we have that baseline now uh, and it gives us uh, information uh, for uh, Allison as, as the new appointee to move forward on what the next steps would look like. And I don't know that they'll look like a continued survey or reactions and recommendations according, uh, that we, according to what we learned from the survey. If you have anything you want to add to that, Allison, I think that'd be really helpful. Sure, Chair Penner. Um, yeah, thanks for that comment. Um, uh, Casey and I, in our capacities, will certainly um, begin to collaborate very shortly here um, and begin to determine what you know what looks best in terms of next steps, whether it's a survey or um, regulations or um, recommendations to local detention facilities. Um, we'll certainly bring back um, the work that we do together in any next steps, recommendations, and, and, and motions for action uh, to this board. Um, and we can certainly, you know, bring any information back at our next meeting. Thank Madam you. Chair, yes, uh, yes. I would just add, um, thank you, Angeles. Uh, so Allison, in her new role as the Director of In-Custody Death Review, will be appearing very regularly before the board for updates on progress um, in the division. And so I think you'll have ample opportunity to hear from her about uh, whether anything further is needed on collecting data like this or or if other kinds of things should be contemplated for surveys or other data collection venues. Um, I would just offer as my, um, my thoughts on this, I think doing this survey was a really, really significant effort for um, many people who are involved in the drafting. And I feel that the the information that has been gleaned is super helpful. Um, I was absolutely uh, surprised and, and 
um, amazed by how many uh, successful interventions there were in the adult facilities over these last six months. And I think that that the um, the information that we needed to answer the question, what's happening in the facilities now, has been answered. So I, th I think there probably might be other kinds of data that are needed to be collected in future um, efforts. But this data set has been collected and provided, I think, extremely helpful information for the questions that had been on the table at the time. Thank you. Yes, Chief. Thank you, uh, Chair Penner. Um, just a question maybe for Casey. Um, on slide four, and this goes to at least one of the public comments, it describes the methods for introduction of opioids uh, into facilities. I know the recommendations, there's a lot a lot to, to left on the recommendations as far as where this can go, but um, is, is there any plans or future plans to really dig into this issue? For instance, that mail package introduction was a pretty significant factor there. Um, as far as the recommendations go, is that something maybe in the future that can be explored in terms of introduction? Because it seems like to me there's two parts of this. There's the introduction and then there's the antagonist of whether those uh, antagonists are available in those facilities. So I think one of the public comments really focused on introduction and where that's going to go. And, and that's my question. At this time, we don't have a plan to, to dig further into that. I think that's something that you know, the director could look at too as well, since that's definitely related to policy and recommendations um, to facilities and regulations. Madam Chair, yeah. I would just add a thought to, uh, to build on what Casey's saying, and I, I really appreciate your question, Chief Scott. Um, this is absolutely sort of how the, the machinery should be working. This survey instrument helps us to understand that you know, in a very significant number of the known instances of introductions, it was um, through mail or packages, and sometimes that might be tossed over a wall or dropped by a drone. You know, lots of different ways. So that information is really helpful and can inform the regulations revision process. So absolutely, these data will be used, and um, our adult regulation revisions process or your adult regulation revisions process um, will begin in 2025 and all of this information will be available for that process. Thank you. Thank you. Um, question, and this may be way outside of our scope, but I'd love to get um, the BSEC's opinion on this and then any law enforcement that sits on the board. Um, about a year and a half ago in, in LA in, in Barry G. Niner Juvenile Hall, a young man I knew who was 18 years old um, died in custody. It's the first death I've seen in 20 years in that juvenile hall um, from a uh, fake Percocet pill that was pure fentanyl. Um, five staff have been removed from Barry J. Nider Juvenile Hall uh, for bringing in drugs uh, over the last year and a half. There's been zero arrests that I know of. Um, the investigation into how those fentanyl pills got in that killed Brian Diaz uh, the LAPD turned it over within a day uh, to the LA County Probation Department, and a year and a half later, there doesn't seem to be any investigation. Um, what role do we play um, in pushing for any investigation into a young person dying in custody? And are there any other law enforcement bodies that could take over an investigation like that? Um, because this was a great young man and however that those pills made into that facility should really be investigated. Um, I'm well aware of the incident, Scott. Thank you for raising it. It's an important conversation. I think if I just say first and foremost, the, the, the survey uh, is what is reported out to us. And um, on a positive note, 100% of the agencies were reporting that out. With that said, um, the internal issues uh, that we see in um, jails and juvenile halls across the state are continuous. And I'm hoping that um, with uh, our new position and Allison taking the reins, that we'll begin to be able to take a deeper dive into uh, strategies to slow the roll of what comes in with the visitor, with uh, custody staff or uh, in the mail. 
we, we don't have those answers at this point. I'm sure that uh, individual uh, facilities across the state are working hard on those very issues also. In terms of, of filing in this instance, um, that is county centric. I mean, that is factually uh, something that would be referred to the district attorney or a law enforcement agency. And I'm not privy to the information you just shared. I have not been privy to the information you shared that it was referred and then given back to the probation department. I couldn't comment on that except, um, you know, uh, we don't have authority over that sort of thing. Uh, filing decision that's made by an individual county. I, it's not much help. It's not much of an answer. Um, I think when Allison is on board, the position that she fills is, is created and designated for uh, recommendations towards stemming some of the conduct you referenced today. Um, and and uh, a particular sheriff or probation chief uh, may take that recommendation and act on it, or may not. I mean, I, I couldn't say for sure at this very moment. It, I don't think that's much help. Allison, you want to add something? What I'll add and one of the things that we'll start looking into almost immediately is how to interact with the board. There is, um, there is provision in the statute for bringing um, recommendations to this board to do what we need to figure out what that looks like. But again, as Katie mentioned, there'll be a lot of engagement with this board. And unfortunately, our job starts with um, incidents that happen beginning on July 1st. You know, hopefully they'll be able to inform tragedy, tragedies, you know, retrospectively, if, if, if that is able to bring any comfort. But, uh, but what this board will be able to do is hear what this team is able to do in terms of reviewing what's going on at those facilities and request um, further action. Again, we need to figure out what that looks like, but there will be engagement, you know, at this level. And we'll Chair Penner, I have a couple of things. Yeah. First of all, Scott, I want to speak directly to you because <clears throat> the my, my the beginning of my career, the bulk of my career was in gang enforcement and and being on task forces and stuff like that. And I don't know always that people understand that we do connect with these kids that we end up interacting with. And even on the advocacy side, I mean, when we lose somebody that we've been trying to help, it's a it's a personal hurt that we go through. And, and we go through it um, on the law enforcement side. Matter of fact, we had our first ever death in our jail, and I lost a staff member over it because he's so distraught that he couldn't do more in the moment that he's retiring. Um, and so I'm not saying that all law enforcement and all cops are that way, but I think that a lot of them are. And so I just want to acknowledge your loss in, in this young man, because yeah, what's great. We have 99% uh, intervention success, but the ones that we didn't save, they matter. Right. So I have a few things to say. I hope I don't get too lost in my thoughts or go too long when it's will cut me off if you need to, but um I do think I take comfort in a hundred percent response on a voluntary um, survey that I think it's hard for you all to get responses on surveys in general and to have a hundred percent response, I think shows that at least the people that are running these facilities, this is an important topic in the introduction of opioids and fentanyl into our facilities. Um, so I'm super happy to see that. And I don't want to make excuses up here, but I want, everyone to understand a few things. I'll take my jail, for example. I have two facilities that I oversee. The county will not fund staffing. The county will not fund a second perimeter fence. The county will not fund mail scanners. The county will not fund a body scanner. Luckily, our friends at Monterey County Sheriff's Office donated a scanner to us. And the county balked at the $8,000 uh, installation fee for like a $2 million or $200,000 machine. So there are a lot of things that I think your public safety leaders are fighting for. And when the funding streams don't come through from our county, because they don't, in my opinion, public safety, definitely the jail is not a priority in San Diego County. It's just not. 
because it's this unseen building that sits off by itself and nobody ever goes in there. We've invited all five of our board members to tour our jail to see exactly what our staff and the incarcerated people are going through. Only one showed up, but they still refused to give me funding. And so I will tell you for me, and this is where this board, I think, is such an important place for us to be, especially as leaders of our offices and leaders in probation, um, is so we can work with it, with everybody to, so you know like where our hearts are and where our passion is. I just was invited to speak in front of the post commission on where I think the shortcomings of Senate Bill 2 police decertification are. That's a really hard thing to do as a department leader when you want your staff to have faith in you as well that you're gonna go speak and how we should tighten up restraints and be able to quote unquote, more easily decertify bad cops. But it's hard to get rid of bad cops, it really is. And it's not for lack of effort. And you know, the district attorneys are autonomous. They can make their own filing decisions. Some we agree with, some we don't. But I will tell you, one of the questions you asked is where else can you look? There is oversight from the Department of Justice and the Attorney General. That is always a place that I've told people in my own community, if they're unhappy with our internal processes and we do our internal affairs, um, we do we bring in a third party independent to do our internal affairs investigations. But when people aren't uh, happy with that, I, I, I urge them to go to, to Rob Bonta's office to make sure that they can have faith in the processes that we're that we're undertaking. So I'm sorry, Chair, that was long-winded, but I wanted to acknowledge Scott's loss. Very, very helpful. Super helpful. Yeah, thank you for that. Very much so. I think demonstrating the competing interests in a county is uh, super enlightening. Uh, everybody has budget constraints, and um, it sounds like you're trying to take measures, but you have the issues that um, fiscally tie your hands somewhat. So that's super helpful. Anything else, Scott, that you're that would help you here? In, you're interested in? No. Okay. Good. Any other board members? Sean. Oh, it's me. You would like me no, to No, just a little closer to oh, the microphone, so please. Hearing nothing. Um, we have a recommendation before the board. I'm looking for a motion and a second. So moved. Thank you. Adam? Chair Penner? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. Mr. Haynes? Aye. Mr. Cor Ms. Corpus? Aye. Mr. Taylor? Aye. Ms. Branning? Aye. Ms. Gard? Aye. Mr. Scott? Aye. Mr. Budnick? Ms. Zaragoza? Aye. Ms. Kumpion? Aye. Ms. Lay? Aye. Thank you. Madam Chair, the motion carries. Thank you, Adam. Moving on now to item G, Proposition 47 Grant Funding Program. I, who's presenting? I thought it was Ian. Okay, okay. Is he not here today? Damien, I'm sorry. And Madam Chair, while we're waiting for that, I think, uh, again, this is our um, proposed grant award items. I would look for Chief Scott to step out of the room. And I, and I do think just out of a, um, even though they're not, potentially a direct awardee, I would look at uh, Ms. Kumpion and Mr. Budnick to yes. recuse. Um, Good advice because they're well. the excellent recusers so they can also teach Chief Scott how to recuse and, and leave Judge, the room. Recuse. Judge Guard's going We're to recuse as well. Thank now. you. So we find okay. you again. Damien has joined us. Well, there you are. Hi, Damien. I was looking Good. for you in the room. I apologize. I apologize for not being able to be there. Okay. And good morning, Ish. <clears throat> should I should I begin? Yes, please. Oh, wonderful. As I said, good morning. Good morning, uh, Madam Chair and members of the board. My name is Damien Renault. I'm a field representative for corrections planning and grant programs. Today I'm presenting agenda item G requesting approval for the Proposition 47 grant program funding recommendations. These funds are awarded to public agencies supporting mental health treatment, substance use disorder treatment, and diversion programs for people in the criminal justice system 
aimed at reducing the recidivism rates of those convicted of less serious crimes. This agenda item requests board approval to fund the proposals as rated and recommended for the funding by the Prop 47 Cohort 4 Rater Panel. The RFP and funding recommendations are included in the board item attachments. We are recommending awarding approximately $167 million in funding while fulfilling all the funds available for Cohort 4, including 23 large and four small scope agencies. As background information, previous boards have awarded funds totaling approximately $324 million covering three cohorts. This cohort four grant agreement covers a timeline of October 3rd today through June 30th, 2028. Uh, I'd like to take just a quick moment to thank the writer panel for their diligence, as well as Stacey Riley and Anna Astreen in the development of the writer processes and training. On behalf of the Prop 47 Raider panel, staff recommends the following. The board approved the funding recommendations as received by the cohort for Raider panel. That concludes my report. Any questions? Thank you, Damian. Any members of the board have any questions or comments regarding the recommendation? Seeing none, Adam? I have no members of the public. Okay, thank you, Adam. Um, I'm now looking uh, for a motion and a second, please. So moved, Chair. Second. Second. Thank you. Adam? Chair Penner? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. Mr. Haynes? Aye. Ms. Corpus? Aye. Mr. Taylor? Aye. Ms. Branning? Aye. Ms. Gard, Mr. Scott, Mr. Budnick, and Ms. Kumpion recuse. Ms. Zaragoza? Aye. Ms. Lay? Aye. Madam Chair, the motion carries for agenda item G. Thank you. Thank you, Damien. Huge, huge uh, amount of money going out into the field. I appreciate all your hard work, and um, it's uh, really exciting to see that uh, go out into the communities across the state. Thank you, Damien. Wonderful. Thank you. Now we can go chase everybody, bring them back to the table. Particularly, let's see, Aaron, you're going to present on item H, correct? That is correct, Madam Chair. That was very fast, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Well, it wasn't short enough for you two not to lose it, uh, Scott. <laughs> yep. 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 And we're just awaiting our executive director. Nobody expected this amount of time, so. Katie's missing in action? Okay. You know how to find her, Adam. Okay, we'll start. Uh, Aaron's going to present on item H, local detention facilities inspection update. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm uh, presenting this item uh, because we're in the process of transitioning people to different roles around the office. This would normally uh, be done by uh, Director Ganter, but uh, she is uh, handing this off for now. So we are going to, um, uh, I just want to address also our new board members. This is a standing board agenda item where we like to report out and update you on the status of our ongoing facility inspections. So we do this uh, at every board meeting to just give you status updates, what our field representatives are seeing in the field and reporting back on on when we are asking for sheriffs to come before the board, um, when uh, if items of noncompliance are not corrected, or when we have um, 
the probation departments coming before the board when we were dealing with the terminations of suitability. And just as a reminder, um, so our facility standards and operations division currently inspects 588 facilities throughout the state of California. We have 18 inspectors on staff to do that. And we try to, um, and at least once a year, we are touching those facilities through inspections, either comprehensive inspections for Title 15 compliance, which is the operations regulations for our local detention facilities, and also looking at Title 24 issues. Title 24 issues are our facility plant issues uh, for our local detention facilities. We also provide technical assistance throughout the year to all of the detention facilities who are requesting technical, uh, technical assistance. And the um, status reports are in your board binder and they're available online for the public to look as well if they have questions in terms of the status and the, uh, the items of non-compliance that we are looking at. So for now, I'd like to begin with the adult inspections. And currently, uh, we don't have any recommendations where we would be looking to request a sheriff to become come before the board to discuss outstanding items of non-compliance. Uh, we are waiting for some corrective action plans for some of those uh, county jail facilities, but we don't have any, uh, any action items with respect to the county jail system. Um, I do want to share, we do want to share that um, you may recall, well, some of you may recall, we have uh, new board members that uh, we recently had uh, Sheriff Luna from the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department come before the board to talk about the items of non-compliance with respect to the safety checks that were going on the Men's Central Jail. Um, they had been out of compliance because uh, what we were seeing in those facilities that uh, was that windows were being covered up so that people could not see and verify that people were safe inside uh, their, their rooms and weren't able to get uh, visual observation. Uh, our field representative, Tracy Kessler, has uh, provided continuous technical assistance and conducted several follow-up inspections mm -hmm. uh, since Sheriff Luna came before the board. And we have seen improvement over these visits, and we can now deem that that issue has been corrected. Uh, the department increased their supervisory review um, and staff accountability for the safety checks and has implemented policy prohibiting the covering of windows and requires staff to remove those coverings. Uh, the safety check documentation is consistent and compliant, and then there is a notable, noticeable change uh, in what is happening in those facilities, and the window coverings are happening a lot less. Um, uh, so with that, I'd like to move on to the review of the juvenile facilities. Um, there are currently five counties it, with items of noncompliance. Um, I'm going to just provide a quick overview of, a, of those facilities, and then I'm going to save an update on Los Angeles County for the end. Uh, we have and are waiting for corrective action plans uh, from LA and Kern County for recent items of noncompliance, and then Mendocino County, Los Angeles, Kings, and Alameda uh, are in the corrective action phase of their corrective action plans, um, and they still have some time to resolve those items of non-compliance. Um, as we talked about at our last meeting, uh, Field Representative Lisa Southwell, um, who has been, as you know, um, uh, down in the Los Angeles juvenile facilities uh, month over month. Uh, she's conducted two inspections each month at the Barry J. Nider facility in Los Petrinos Juvenile Hall since the April board meeting. Uh, for those inspections, they have been announced and unannounced as well. Uh, during the June 27th announced inspection at Los Padrinos Juvenile Hall, uh, we issued uh, a finding of non-compliance with Section 1371 Programs Recreation and Exercise. Um, while documentation of programs indicating compliance with that section, our video review showed that uh, not all pro programs were being documented, uh, are, were actually occurring as uh, documented. Uh, we noticed the agency on June 28th, and a cap was approved on August 8th. Uh, the county has indicated that they would have those issues corrected by October 15th, uh, and we will be verifying uh, compliance uh, after October 15th. Uh, additionally, on August 12th, we noticed the county uh, that the Los Pedrinos Juvenile Hall was out of compliance with Section 1321 staffing. 
in addition to the documentation indicating that staffing minimums were not being consistently met, uh, several areas uh, have been impacted by the lack of staffing, including things such as education, recreation, and medical appointments. Uh, we need to have an approved cap on file, uh, and it's due needs to be approved by the BSCC by October 11, 2024. Uh, we have not yet received a draft cap from the county uh, uh, with respect to that item. Uh, in addition, we have scheduled a comprehensive inspection for Los Padrinos uh, during the week of October 14th. Um, finally, I uh, would like to note that we have completed the comprehensive inspection for Barry J. Knight or secure secured youth treatment facility uh, during the week of September 22nd through 27th. Uh, during that inspection, we found uh, some items of non-compliance as well, including uh, room confinement and uh, grievances and regarding the clothing exchange and those, those details are avail available as well. Uh, Barry J. Nader of SYTF must submit an approved corrective action plan by November 26, 2024. Um, and so at, at this time, I would like to just acknowledge that we received a public comment regarding Los Padrinos and, um, and what, this, what the overall status is with Los Padrinos. So as I noted, um, we, they are currently in the corrective action plan process. And for, for those, some of the board members, as we've done the onboarding process, um, what we would be looking at is if Los Padrinos does not come back into compliance, uh, by their deadlines, we would be doing um, what we call a determin another determination of suitability at the November board meeting with respect to programs and recreation. Um, if we do not receive an approvable cap regarding their staffing issues um, uh, by October 11th, then we would be uh, finding them unsuitable at that point. So that that is the overall update regarding Los Padrinos, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Aaron. I, I did have a quick question, Chair Penner. Um, just for the benefit, because of the point you just made regarding the, the new members to the board, and we recently um, uh, approved an updated CAP process. And so just so that I'm clear about the timelines, Aaron, um, and I'm not speaking specifically to LA, but just in general, because there, there like you said, there are several um, juvenile agencies who are in the midst of working through a cap, but just so that um, I understand it. So if a if if a probation department says that we're going to complete our um, we're going to resolve our cap issue by uh, November the 9th, and but they but the ninety days would end November twenty fourth. Um, the BSCC is holding the no, the November 9th as the date that they would have to come into compliance. Is that correct? Yeah, Chief. So it so the the deadlines that are required are so they have um, sixty days in order to get an approved cap on file, right. and then they have a reasonable period of time not to exceed ninety days to come into compliance. Okay, right. And we we work with the county to establish what that reasonable time frame is, and if the county is trying to hit that mark before um, the full ninety days, then we will hold them to that earlier thing. At, but understanding that if they um, needed the full time within the 90 days, we are receptive to um, any circumstances that may have required them to go beyond that reasonable time frame. And I think that was my question. If someone doesn't, let's say they anticipate that, you know, I'm not going to be able to hit my forecasted date to be to come into compliance. What's the process for the agency to make that request that I'm going to need the full 90 days? Do they just make the request to you who used to be Allison or the director <laughs> or what's the... Just so that I'm clear on that. Just consult. Uh, yeah, no, they can reach out to the field rep and then we'll consult with uh, who will be the acting deputy director in that in that role. Okay, I yeah. just wanted to get it for clarity. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I do. Um, you know, I'd like... To I'd like to thank the coalition of organizations that sent in the public comment letter specific to the Los Padrinos facility. And, you know, we have been 
um, for them to point out that Los Padrinos has, you know, been open for nearly 14 months and has been out of compliance with one or more of the minimum standards for 10 of those months. Um, and, you know, did a great job of summarizing uh, the conversation that was had during the April board meeting. And so I just like, what is what is our plan here? You know, we've done kind of a song and dance with with L.A. County um, for quite some time. And I just would love to hear Chair Penner specifically. They quote um, some of the comments you made during that meeting. And I just you know, would love to hear um, what's our plan here for Los Padrinos. I mean, it sounded like we were willing to um, expedite the timeline to deal with this, you know, ongoing staffing issue. Um, LA County has continued to put, you know, band-aids over an issue that is a, a gaping wound. We continue to see um, problems on the ground. How are we gonna go forward? with LP. Well, thank you, Angela. You you saved me from having to uh, explain myself by raising it yourself. Let me say this. Um, I think we have to allow for the CAP process uh, to take place and get their CAP back to this agency, and then we are able to respond. If we think it is, uh, how would I put this? Uh, unrealistic or cannot be met, then I think we can take action. At this juncture, uh, there are a number of outlying issues that we're waiting for the county to respond to. Uh, and I think we have to let that period of time lapse and then move forward expeditiously. Do you have anything to add, Aaron? I want to help. Uh, no, so and, I, and, I, and I understand, uh, yeah, and I, I will just say I understand um, uh, the, the frustration. Absolutely. I think we are um, frustrated with, with the status of Los Angeles County. Um, and, you know, and I, and I will take um, note my own remarks, which was, you know, there, there is a um, theoretical argument and how we could accelerate the process. It is it is based on the, the, the how the statute reads. I the the status of what is going on in the facilities right now though is the 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 safer path in terms of um, upholding the actions of this board is as Chair Penner said is to let the timelines that are set forth in the statute play out. And so that is what we are doing right now and. Uh, if Los Padrinos is not in compliance with their um, uh, program's recreation uh, corrective action plan, they will be up for determination of suitability at the next board meeting. Well, it, does, it doesn't feel good, but I, I commend you in giving us a, a direction to move forward in and do it um, according to the timelines that uh, we had adopted in our cap policy. So um, does that help you at all, uh, Annalise? I'm, can we do anything to um, shore up your feelings? Unfortunately, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I, you know, this, this plays out and affects these young people every day. You know, it, the ripple effect of the staffing in particular um, is very daunting and overwhelming and impacts programming, education, all of the, you know, basics that we should be providing these young people. And um, I just haven't seen or heard sustainable long-term solutions come out of LA County probation. And until they feel the fire underneath them, which for some in, insane, you know, reason they they still have not. Um, I I just don't see, but the fundamental change that we need to see here, and I just feel like we're on. It's like Groundhog's Day. This is just, you know, going to keep on going from my perspective, and I believe that 
we could and 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 should be doing more, even if it means um, expediting the timelines in a way to actually have them feel that pressure. Can I comment, Chair Penner? Um, just I, I was also quoted in this letter, and I appreciate everybody on the coalition and. I hope that they're also, um, I don't know this because I'm i am ignorant to this, but also pr presenting in front of the Board of Supervisors to make sure that they're pressuring the County of LA to fund and fix these problems. Because I can tell you as a department head, we try and try and try to fill our staffing and without the support of the board, it's just not gonna happen. Um, so, but with that, I, one of the things that I was concerned about and I continue to be concerned about and I can just relate this in the way of when we look at training new police officers, and deputy sheriffs, we look for patterns of behavior. And so there are mistakes that people make in their one-offs and we correct that behavior. But when you see disturbing patterns of behavior, I think that that's indicative of what we're gonna see in the future. And what I've seen so far in my short time on this board is that there is a pattern of behavior at LP that's concerning to me, but I'm also extremely sensitive to following what the legislature has intended and the rules that have been put in place. And if the legislature and the rules intended to give these timelines, I think that as the board, we need to stick to that. But at the same time, what my comments were, they're quoted in this letter and what I'll say again today, my biggest concern is they're gonna come into compliance in the 11th hour and then they're gonna fall out of compliance again. They're gonna come back into compliance and they're gonna fall out of compliance. We're gonna play this game with these statutes that they can kind of like be good for a minute. And this is what we see in employees. You, for, for the other department heads here, you, you, you discipline an employee and they behave for a, a period of time. And then all of a sudden they drift off and they reoffend. And unless we have, um, you know, unless we do have a true fire behind this, um, that's my biggest concern. And so I will reaffirm what I said before I took comfort in the conversation that we had that we weren't gonna to have to start these processes all over again each time. And I am extremely concerned about the behavior there, but also sensitive to when we're talking about, I'll just talk to speak to the staffing levels alone. What I'm going through in my own correctional facility right now is that we are, have very low staffing levels because we cannot pay competitively. We cannot attract quality candidates. We're attracting applicants and I think you would be terrified if we brought them into public safety based on their backgrounds. And so we have to make sure that we're not lowering the standard just to fill positions to meet some quota with substandard people. They're gonna create bigger, pro we're talking about bringing substances into our correctional facilities. If we lower the bar on who we're allowing to come into this profession, we're gonna have those type of, of problems. So I'm sensitive to LA if they're not getting the support from the county but I'm also worried that we're going to keep going in this circle. Appreciate that. I I share your frustration. Chair Penner, one, yes. just one, one thing. And I, I want to echo uh, Sheriff Taylor and, and some of the concerns about the staffing because I think that's not, it's not an LA probation problem. I think it's a, it's a problem both in adult and juvenile facilities, mine as well in Fresno. Um, and so without the support of the board, and your county HR and so many other entities that um, that you have to work with in order to, to make sure that you have a, a solid uh, way to be able to, to recruit and to also retain staff. Um, and, and I've said this before, not just about LA, but any county, you have to have all of those pieces in place in order to support that ongoing piece. So we can hire people all day long, great people. But the problem is, is if the facility and the, and the environment, if the culture, is so tainted. Even when you bring people on, they're on for maybe a couple of weeks and then they're out of there. And so it takes um, some long-term um, work in order to get all of those things in place. And the probation department on its own um, can't not do that. And so that has always been one of the biggest concerns that I've had. And at the end of the day, our youth and our staff who are actually there you know, really trying to do the right thing. They're showing up to work, working double shifts, um, doing all those things while um, you have some staff who don't pull their weight. They don't show up to work. 
We've heard uh, Scott talk about how many people in, in Los Angeles just will not honor the shift that they've been given. Um, and so it goes to the staffing issue that um, it takes, you know, personnel actions and it takes a lot of different things. But at the end of the day, we need to support, you know, what we're trying to do to make sure that kids and staff are safe there. Um, but I believe we we put the cap plate, we put the cap process in place so that there could be some structure that all of us could be able to to, to work or work with. And so I, I agree that we do need to work through that, through the through the process. But you know, with the work that that Lisa Southwell is doing down in Los Angeles and keeping very close tabs on what's going on there, um, you know, I want us to, to to trust that process so that we can get through that. Um, and when the time, if 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 they don't come into compliance, then you know the board will have to take action. But we we need to come up and to be able to help with some long term solutions with Los Angeles, and it's um, and it's long, it's a bigger thing than just bringing the chief here. Um, so we need to, to, to put our heads together to figure this out because we really don't have an option. You know, Los Angeles being the, the largest county and uh, with so many young people who are there who are in desperate need of the help. Um, so we're obligated to do that. But uh, we do need to walk through this process in order to get there. And I'd just like to qualify one thing, Chair Penner, is that though I'm empathetic and sensitive to the staffing issue, I am not empathetic and sensitive if a report is not accurate. If video is not matching what's being written down on paper, that to me is I'm, I'm I'm not sensitive and empathetic with that. I'm only speaking to the struggles with staffing, not to integrity. Anybody else? Um, Adam, do you have members of the public that would like to comment? Yes, um, we have four members of the public, and if we could get the timer up. And first, I'm going to call on call Yusuf on. Miller. Yusuf, go, go ahead. You have two minutes. Yes, this is Yusuf Miller, North County Equity and Justice Coalition, Saving Lives in Custody Campaign of 2020. And I want to support my ally, allies and colleagues in the uh, San Diego County that's putting up these, these um, claims against this county for uh, this habitual uh, line crossing. It's like where they're non-compliance, then there's a cap, unsuitability, back into client uh, compliance, ro revolving door. This gives no one any security. No one feels that anything is going to change if this revolving door. Why can't we implement a special process for habitual unsuitability? Uh, the people who are frequent unsuitable uh, and patterns of unsuitability have a process to deal with them particularly. So just to, to implement that. And the inspections, hopefully some of our new staff, I wanna welcome the new staff that has come in, congratulations. Particularly, I want to say welcome and it's a breath of fresh air to Dr. Lai. Dr. Lai, thank you for being here. And we as the North County Equity and Justice Coalition, the families in San Diego County, we would like to invite you. We're gonna uh, hit you up on, on uh, your email and invite you to do a Zoom and explain to the community what your plans are for the future and what your position is. And also I wanna welcome um, Ms. Uh, Ganter for her position as well. And I wanna offer the same. So we'll be reaching out to you for you to uh, reach out to the community and uh, provide a Zoom so that people can hear what you're doing, what your plan for the future is. Because these inspections, they mostly uh, in, in the in custody death realm, it's mostly the, the checks that people have that are not being done on time. We have almost over a dozen families who have lost loved ones just simply from not being checked on a frequent and the, the frequency that they're supposed to, or they're in a mental health crisis and they're not properly designated to be in the mental health crisis uh, uh, um, unit. So uh, thank you. For thank you. Um, next, we have Bip. Bip Roberts, please go ahead and unmute yourself. Well, I was just going to say that, um, you know, I really appreciate all and all the input. You know, we are on the front line up here in Alameda County, and we see this on a daily basis in the navigation center that we currently run here on Market Street. Um, the opioid, um, the schizophrenia, the formerly incarcerated that are homeless, 
needing a way and a path. And that is something that uh, here on the front line, we're trying to make sure that we give them the opportunities that are needed. And so I, I just thank the panel for the ideas that I've heard, um, the knowledge that I didn't have that I now have. And so I just really wanna say thank you all for bringing something to the table that's gonna help us out here on the front line, make sure that those who are in need are able to get to programs that are gonna actually help them uh, get back on their feet. So that's, that's what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Aditi. Aditi Sharkar, Children's Defense Fund, California. First, just want to say thank you to Angeles for reading the letter and uplifting it here. And want to remind this board that while it may safer option for you to wait for the cap. It's not safer for the young people inside LP who remain in unsafe conditions and have for over 70% of their time there. So when you are presented with a cap, you know, in the next week or so, it would be extremely disappointing if you were to turn around and approve a corrective action plan when everybody in this room, everybody all over California knows that there is no world in which this corrective action plan will actually will will fix this issue because we've had so many opportunities to do that in LA County and they have failed every single time. And it is imperative that when you receive the corrective action plan from LA County next week, that you take into account everything that you're saying here today, everything you said at the April meeting, all of the history. And if you could, if you turn around and still approve a corrective action plan when you know that there is no way they can sustain it, that you are just as much at fault as LA County probation when these young people suffer. And I have hopes based on your discussion today that you will take that into account and you will not approve the cap next week. And I also want to just uplift that, you know, a lot has been said about staffing in LA County. There are enough probation officers on the payroll in LA County. They just refuse to come to work. The issue is call outs. It's not that there are not sufficient numbers. And it is a false narrative to say that this department needs more funding or needs more bodies. It's just that they will not show up to work and that's how bad the conditions are there. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Nancy. Nancy Juarez, Center on Juvenile and Criminal Justice. Today we're talking about LA, but youth in every single county are at risk because of the precedent that's been, that has been set that any probation department in California can operate unsafe halls that aren't meeting minimum standards and they'll be given a pass and a chance and a chance and a chance up until the worst happens. Los Padrinos opened in July 19, 2023, and yet barely a month later, BSCC staff was notified LA County of numerous violations of minimum standards. For the 14 months that LP has been open, 10 of those, they've been out of compliance. As the letter outlines, since its opening, youth and LP have spent 70% of their time in an out of compliant facility. This is a crisis. Not even 24, after, 24 hours after the board found LP suitable to house youth, the LA Times released a video showing LA probation officers encouraging a group of youth under their care to assault another young person. And I haven't heard a single board member mention this. This past July, one, of the, one out of five shifts at LP failed to meet minimum standards. And this does go beyond lack of staffing. These are call outs. Probation does not wanna show up to work. What does that say about the culture inside these facilities? And this is a matter of integrity. BSEC's inspector found falsified reports of programming that does not match the video proof. As Sheriff Taylor said, these are patterns. We've been here before and the young people inside are the ones who are suffering. I urge the board to stand by your promise, act swiftly, don't restart a months long process. Please adopt the path your former counsel laid out. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have uh, Paloma. 
Hello, my name is Paloma Serna. I'm the mother of Elisa Serna, who died in San Diego uh, Detention Whoa. Center on November 11th, 2019. I spoke last year regarding this juvenile hall, the Los Padrinos. Um, you know, it's a shame to know that, you know, they're, they are pretty much getting away um you know and there's no accountability i have a, a friend a family where her children um were in custody and um there was report of sexual abuse the staff was having the son and other boys fight like it was some type of game. This is disgusting. These are our children. To me, the only solution that I could see is shut it down again. Clean house. It's The safety of the children is what's important. We don't want to um, have them grow up and, 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 you know, and go to jail, to, you know, or to prison or, you know, or even worse. We need to stop and give them a better uh environment so uh let's shut it down let's get you know let's you know correct the people on top so you know the employees would want to go to work where they would have the compassion you know for these children you know the community children our children thank you thank you next we have um Malili Malili I'm sorry Millie Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, my name is Melinda Kakani. I'm with the Children's Defense Fund California. I also happen to sit on the Probation Oversight Commission uh, where I'm able to go inside facilities and see what's exactly um, happening and what our young folks are, in, are experiencing. Uh, we don't have to allow the CAP process to take place, Chair Penner. In fact, your legal counsel said as much at the last meeting. Every time this board shows up, the majority of you prioritize giving a pass to carceral institutions, as opposed to meaningfully protecting the young folks and the adults inside these facilities. You referenced a safer path, Chair Penner. The last time you all took a safer path, Brian Diaz died, and that's on you all. This isn't about feelings. This is about the lives of young people, their safety, their well-being, their community safety, and whether or not they end up in prison, whether or not they come home alive. The fact that it's October 3rd and LA hasn't even submitted a draft cap says a lot about their intention and ability to fix this issue. And this is not about the Board of Supervisors who have thrown every single resource at probation, every single dollar at probation, a budget that supersedes $500 million for 500 kids. This isn't about staffing and having enough people on the payroll. As caller after caller has said, this is about folks choosing to not show up. Unfortunately, the young folks don't have a choice, but the adults do. And when they decide not to show up, they place young people in harm's way. And when you choose to take the safer path, you also place young people in harm's way. So I ask you to move with integrity, and I ask you to meaningfully do your job and ensure that these young people are safe and not just rely on the safer, frankly, easier route. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have Tyreek. Hello, can you all guys hear me? Yes. Uh, good afternoon, board. Um, I'm Tyreek Ship with the Anti-Recidivism Coalition. Um, I'm here just to talk about like uh, this issue of non-compliance, right? And earlier this year, we were speaking about Barry J as uh, out of compliance, but we see now like credible messengers programming have went into Barry J and and have been effective at stabilizing it, right? Making it a conducive work environment for staffing and people to want to come in, but also for the youth and and allowing youth to really flourish inside that that uh, facility. Now with with this with this facility, we see that it's still in and out of compliance, and there's a a minimum of pro, a minimum amount of programming, incredible messengers, and that's an issue because the youth aren't getting everything they need, and and I feel like credible messengers and programming, we don't do enough on the minimum basic standards to allow our youth to have these things. So really, I'm here to express that we change the minimum basic standards so that these youth can get mentorship and and uh, programming. So. This in work environment isn't something that 
the, the staff can claim that they're so afraid of, but it's actually something where they can go to work and if they don't go to work, then we know what's the reason why. But I think that's what it, we really need is to change the minimum basic standard for housing these young people where they do get mentorship and programming a lot more and then see if these staff don't come. And then that's when we can really hold L.A. County accountable for not no staffing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to call anyone in the room who wishes to make a public comment. Please proceed to the podium. We do not have any in the room. Thank you. Back to the board. Um, any other questions, comments, concerns? Uh, this item uh, is uh, a discussion item today, and there is no recommendation before the board. With that said, uh, we're moving on to the next item on the agenda, which is public comment board uh, coming to a close and that is any member of the public uh, or in the room I mean I'm sorry virtually I may comment on any item they wish to um we currently have two members of the public who wish to make a um, comment if there are anyone else please feel free to raise your hand now and I'm going to call the first person and that would be Paloma Paloma you have two minutes please go ahead Hi, yes, my name is Paloma Serna. I'm the mother of Elisa Serna, who was killed in the Los Colinas jail on November 11, 2019 by retired deputy Rashawn Foster, who dragged Elisa in the midst of a seizure. Deputy Lucas Lacey Lovisa, Deputy Tony Hall Bennett, Dana Lee Pasquale, Dr. Carol Gilmore, Dr. Friedrich Von Lente, and many more. And I'm with the North County Equity and Justice Coalition and the Saving Lives in Custody of California. The San Diego Sheriff Department has been criticized for inadequate wet safety checks and handing and handling of in custody deaths. Deputies are required to ensure inmates are alive and well every hour, but reports indicate that these checks often fall short. There have been many reports from our Citizen Law Enforcement Review Board in San Diego that have highlighted insufficient checks and slow responses to emergency, underscoring the need for stricter and more cons uh, consistent safety protocols to prevent in-custody deaths. Also, there are two deaths, Lonnie Ruper, who lost 60 pounds, who died of dehydration and malnutrition, and Eric Bach, who also um, died um, from his diabetes. He was being neglected 12 hours with no insulin, and he died from that. Um, so he was neglected by deputies and medical staff. Both of these deaths were rue as a homicide. The sheriff has a history of not turning over their investigation to the district attorney. There are bad cops, but I do understand there are also good cops. But these bad cops, they need there needs to be a change. Excuse me, these bad cops, they need to be charged criminally for these two deaths and more. Give us justice. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have um, Cheryl Canson. Cheryl, please go ahead. Um, there she is. is it my turn, Sabrina Weddle? Yes. Oh. yes. No, I'm, no, I'm Cheryl. here. Cheryl Canson's oh. here. Hi, I'm Cheryl Canson, San Diego native. Treat me, don't mistreat me, and the me is in my mental illness and also Moms Against Torture. I need now a welfare check for my son. This happened Tuesday. I have not heard from him Wednesday nor today. So that is what I need to happen now. And I just think about others who don't have anyone that would stay on the phone to comfort their loved one as they needed right then. Um, there needs to be ways for people to immediately respond to crisis, mental health crisis, medical crisis. It, it, there just needs to be a change that way. I'm just wondering if someone from the outside, like a medical crisis response team, they could be reached from the outside that would make a call to the inside because my son was like in crisis and could not trust the, the medical staff because they he felt they're part of the problem and were in cahoots to take his life so he feels how he feels 
So I'm just, I need that. And I, I would love to get the email of Scott to email him. Thank you. Thank you. Do we, have we provided Scott's? If the um, caller would please send the email to the public comment line, Adam can forward it to yeah. Scott. So please do send that. Cheryl, I hope you're still listening and heard that. Um, Yusuf, you're next. And Yusuf, before you start, if you could send me your email address as well. Yes, and... I can. All right, go ahead. Thank you. I'm Yusuf Miller, North County Equity and Justice Coalition, Saving Lives and Custody Campaign. And we started this campaign back in 2020. And this campaign is the inspiration for SB 519 and SB AB 268. So I'm so excited to see that Dr. Lai has filled the position of the, the mental health staffer. And I'm, I'm, I think we're waiting on a medical health staffer. And I want to also welcome uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Ganter for her position as director of in custody deaths. These positions are very sorely needed. We're so glad that you're here and you're gonna hit the ground running. I know uh, you're new to the position, they just opened, but the community wants to hear from you. The community wants to know what your plans are and we will be inviting you to have this community uh, uh, interaction via Zoom because we're way down in San Diego. If you can come down here, great. But if not, we'll open um, a, a Zoom town hall so you can communicate to the community to the community. And we so um, in San Diego County and other counties throughout the state, you'll see a lot of death by uh, uh, addiction, death by um, mental health issues, death by medical issues like uh, Paloma Cerna has mentioned uh, some of our people. Uh, have lost their lives due to neglect of medical staff, which sometimes doesn't fall under the jurisdiction of, of, of these uh, institutions, but they are part of our trauma. So we have to mention them and call them out. So hopefully we see some new directions coming from these new seats and we welcome you and our eyes are on you because we've been suffering and everybody in this count, uh, state has been suffering for a while on these preventable deaths throughout the county. And as Paloma Cerna said, she's, she's not uh, targeting everyone, but there are those bad actors that just really need to be uh, held accountable legally with arrests or whatever is appropriate. Thank you. All right, next we have Sabrina. Hello, my name is Sabrina Weddle. I am also with the North County Equity and Justice Coalition. My brother, Saxon Rodriguez, died in San Diego County Jail July 20th, 2021, just four days into being booked into jail. He had court the next day. Um, I sat in front of the San Diego County Sheriff yesterday, Kelly Martinez, at the club meeting where my nine-year-old brother also spoke. Um, we need change here in San Diego. Um, you know, there have been a number of lawsuits that have happened um, due to the lack of sheriff's care. Um, fortunately for me, I was given um, a sheriff's report with names that were not redacted. So, you know, every day I have to live with the fact that An um, Brian Powell, Andrew Randovich, Maxwell Rimple, and Andre Wanzer will never be held responsible for checking my brother too late. Not only did he die from fentanyl and methamphetamine, but he died because the sheriffs did not do their job properly. The medical examiner stated them their cells that five minutes and 28 seconds cost my brother his life. He could have been revived if they had did their job right. Yet those four deputies will never be held accountable. CLERB also has no jurisdiction over medical, and a, a nurse, Melissa Burns, who worked the day that my brother died, stated jail is the best place to receive treatment for an overdose, and I don't know how she brought her lips to say that when she did not save my brother. On top of it, there should not be fentanyl in jail. My brother did not take his drugs into jail because Chula Vista PD gave me his drugs after he was dead. He received those drugs inside of San Diego County Jail and CLERB determined that. But because CLERB has no jurisdiction over anything, nobody will be held accountable. But I will continue to say those deputies' names along with rest in peace to Saxon Rodriguez, my little brother. Thank you, Sabrina. Um, next, we have Lena. Good afternoon, Lena Mallet with the Children's Defense Fund. Um, 
Every day, community loses faith in this body. I've been engaging in this space only for a little over a year and have already witnessed this very cycle several times with the same outcome where young people's continued suffering and abuse is sustained and protected over real transparency and accountability for these departments that are causing harm. There are no measures in this process and no entity either here or LA County Board of Supervisors that seems to take responsibility for initiating the shift needed to achieve safety and healing for young people inside. It is not enough for this board to deem the hall unsuitable. There needs to be pressure applied from the state encouraged by this body onto the LA County Board of Supervisors to ensure that measures like expedited decarceration efforts and supportive wraparound re-entry supports are funded and implemented immediately. The county has poured, quote, all of their resources into supporting probation's falsified compliance over and over again, and I wonder when they will do the same for the protection of our young folks who are caged. There is no corrective action plan that would ever amend the pain, the negligence, and the abuse that has been perpetuated by the department and documented tactfully by this body. Thank you. As you can see, there's um, two names left. That's Michael and Javier. Um, you sent in an email and that has been shared with the board members. If you would still like to speak, please raise your hand so that I could find you. I'll give you a second. And um, that's it for those on Zoom. If there's anyone in the room who wish to make a public comment, please proceed to the podium. And we have none. That's it for right. public comments. There's no comment uh, by the board. Uh, we can adjourn. Anybody like to make a final comment before we close? All right. Uh, this meeting is officially adjourned. The next board meeting is November 21st, 2024. And thank you all for your participation.